Okay, so good morning. I'm Leslie Schaller with the Appalachian Center for Economic Networks, welcoming you to the Central Appalachian Network and the USDA Fair Food Systems Summit. Um, folks have been emailing us saying they've been having a little bit of trouble entering uh, the Zoom room this morning. Uh, so we're getting a little bit of a late start, but I'm sure we'll catch up. Um, I'm going to start sharing uh, some slides here just to orient us. Uh, this is Summit 6. This is our final, and as I like to refer to it, our capstone summit. Uh, we've been on this journey. Um, well, many of us have been on this journey for well over a year as we've prepared uh, the content for these six summits. But they first uh, began in July. Uh, we had four in a series, and then we've had some hiccups here in 2023. So our Summit 5 was in January, and now we're um, hosting our final summit today in March. For those of you who have been with us uh, through most of uh, uh, these summits, you'll remember that we do have all of them recorded, and they're available on the cannetwork.org uh, website. CAN recently has contracted with an incredible uh, marketing firm led by Dawn Crawford. And Dawn and her team have been doing uh, really some amazing refreshing of the CAN website, which has been a little bit neglected and out of date. So we're going to excerpt uh, a lot of these sessions uh, to add content um, uh, to the CAN website. So if you have been a presenter, whether you're presenting today or whether you've presented in the previous five summits, we might be reaching out to you to let you know that those links, uh, links will uh, go live at some point in the next couple of months. Um, we're hoping that people return uh, to the archives of these summits. We feel like there's a lot of incredible uh, uh, information um, many of the PowerPoint uh, slides and resources that our presenters uh, put together, I think, is going to be very helpful for people uh, throughout the region. And I think in many ways uh, throughout rural America, a lot of the issues and the topics we've been tackling, I think, really inform the work uh, across the U.S., especially in rural places. So I just want to, again, thank everyone for their incredible par participation, all the contributions that folks have made. Uh, there's been um, a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, I will say that at times, particularly for me, this has been a struggle uh, to keep this information current uh, and do promotion. So if there's colleagues that aren't joining us live today that you think would benefit from th this information, uh, please direct them to cannetwork.org. And we'll probably, no promises immediately, but I'm hoping at some point in April, we'll kind of do a, a summary highlight, uh, especially if we get some of these links um, up and ready to go to repost and share for folks as well. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And we'll look at some of the slides we're going to start out with. Do people see my screen, I hope? Yes. OK, a summit on scalable solutions to creating community food systems. Um, we have really uh, appreciate the support that we've received. Obviously, uh, we have Juliana Arnett here today uh, as one of our keynote speakers from USDA uh, to talk about many of the USDA programs that have been so critical to propel our work uh, throughout Central Appalachia. But I also want to address the fact that this has been sponsored by the Educational Foundation of America. EFA has provided uh, consistent uh, grant funding uh, to many of the anchor organizations throughout CAN as well, and uh, has just been a great leader in terms of 
really approaching some of the challenges and some of the solutions uh, that we are developing on the ground uh, to create a fair food system throughout Appalachia. We also want to thank the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky and the Sugarbush Valley Impact Investments Group. Uh, they work very closely uh, at a sub-regional level. Uh, in Ohio, uh, ACENET and Rural Action have a wonderful relationship with Sugar Bush Valley Impact Investors. They're providing uh, more venture uh, investment to many of our processors uh, throughout southeastern Ohio. So just memory lane here, <laughs> our goals for this summit. Uh, we've really wanted to facilitate a learning environment, uh, really talking about some of the problems related to nutrition and food security. Uh, I think many of us throughout the region, no matter uh, what our areas of focus are, really always see the healthy food access, making local food affordable uh, for all our community members in each of our subregions. Uh, we've really engaged a coalition of organizations to work and build uh, a more resilient and accessible community food system. So throughout the six summits, we've been able to highlight some of those models. Again, we hope people find this information useful, no matter what stage they might be uh, within their communities developing uh, more accessible and local food systems. And then we've employed technical assistance from the USDA. Uh, many of our friends at the USDA have been uh, involved in the development of these agendas. Uh, we've had USDA staff members uh, address topics in all six of these summits. So again, can't say enough. We really appreciate the role and the leadership that USDA has provided uh, throughout this process. And then probably near and dear to many of us who are practitioners on the ground doing this work, uh, we definitely wanna figure out how to attract more federal, public and private funding. Uh, there's a lot going on throughout Central Appalachia, but there are a tremendous amount of gaps uh, as well. So what we're looking for, I think, as peer learners on this journey is coming up with more uh, collaboration, more opportunities to innovate, to really secure uh, more investment so that we can scale or replicate much of the work that is achieving um, some pretty profound impacts. And then we continue to invite nonprofit partners within Central Appalachia uh, to join us. There's a lot of different ways that people can become involved with the Central Appalachian Network. Uh, we have three food and ag system working groups that we really encourage people to participate in. We'll do a little uh, slide uh, again at the end of our session today just to remind people how they can participate. We're really uh, dedicated to inclusion and diversity. So we want people uh, working at any level at any scale within their communities to join us because that's really part of this peer exchange journey is doing this work together and the working groups really provide that container. So this is just a quick snapshot of our agenda today. I'm not gonna go too deep into it. Um, we've obviously welcomed you all. Uh, we've reviewed some of the goals. Um, I think, as I said, we'll be measuring uh, some of the impacts now after session six and probably send out a report uh, showcasing uh, much of the uh, resources and materials that people have developed as presenters. So what I'd like to do right now uh, is welcome Juliana Arnett. Uh, from USDA, Juliana is the local and regional food system senior agricultural marketing specialist trans for transportation and marketing programs through the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service, or AMS, as we like to say, because, you know, we all love acronyms. So anyway, Juliana, that's quite a mouthful in terms of uh, your title. 
Um, I'm wondering if you could share a, a little bit uh, about your role at first, maybe at USDA, uh, while sure. I get ready to pull up your slides. Absolutely. Um, yes, our, our titles are a lot, but basically what you need to remember is I support interagency coordination around local and regional foods here at the USDA while I am housed at the Agriculture Marketing Service, I can work across our 29 agencies and offices, um, making sure that we're coordinated and collaborating on our local and regional foods oriented programs, research and resources. Um, prior to coming to AMS, I've been out in Washington DC for the last two years. I lived in California for a long time, 15 years working both on the ground to support local and regional foods um, and then also as the USDA FNS farm to school regional lead for the region out there but I got my start in food systems in Columbus Ohio so really excited to be here today um, with folks in that central Appalachia area. Well, we're delighted to have you here, Juliana. Um, we really appreciate all the work <laughs> that USDA AMS has been leading. Um, I think many of us on this call are quite excited to hear soon uh, the announcements for the regional food business centers. Certainly, I will not put you on the spot, um, <laughs> but you know, there's a lot of anticipation in terms of that new program. Uh, I think many of us are just so excited to be able to uh, develop a pipeline of our uh, food and farm entrepreneurs, many of them pretty mature enterprises who would be great candidates for the Business Builder Awards. Uh, it's going to be a real game changer um, for a lot of these folks throughout our region, particularly. And then probably I think many people on the call uh, we're oftentimes partners preparing uh, some maybe regional applications for some of the LAMP program grants that you're going to be showcasing today. So uh, we really recognize that we couldn't do this work without you. So I think everyone can hopefully see Juliana's slides. <laughs> and um, probably, Juliana, if you can just tell me when to go to the next slide. I'll try and anticipate it, but if I move too quick or move too slow, just let me know. Great, thank you. Now, very excited to make our announcement. It is coming soon, um, but we want to make sure that we have yet another tool to put out in the field to really support the work that we know that you're already doing. Um, so excited to share that announcement when it comes. And today I'm gonna focus on local agriculture market program, which I know is very old hat to many of you. So this is just going to be a refresher um, on and some updates on what's new for this year. And then also, you know, I will stay on for most of the call and happy to talk about stacking other USDA resources too, if that is of interest. You can go to the next slide. Again, I know that this is going to be very familiar to many of you, but for those that may not be familiar with LAMP or just need a quick refresher. This is a 2018 Farm Bill program, the Local Agriculture Market Program, or LAMP, you will hear us say quite often. It houses three key programs. That's the Farmers Market and Local Food Promotion Program, which we actually run as two separate programs, the Regional Food System Partnership Grant Program, and then Value Added Producers Grant Program. So AMS, as um, you're likely familiar, runs the Farmers Market and Local Food Promotion Program and then the Regional Food System Partnership Program. However, our partners at Rural Development administer the Value Added Producer Grant. So I'll focus mostly on AMS programs today, but I will share a brief slide about the Value Added Producers Grant um, since that application period is also currently open. All right, well, um, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, just to put this in context, we have $133 million available for LAMP this year. So this is quite a large pot of money that is available and we hope to get every dollar um, out the door. So we want to see lots of applications. Um, we have 15 million for the, approximately 15 million for the Farmer's Market Promotion Program, 62 million for the Local Food Promotion Program, and then 
56 million for the regional food systems partnership. I will say that as part of this funding, we do have supplemental American um, Rescue Plan Act dollars to continue to support a focus on farm to institution. Next slide. So for the farmer's market and local food promotion, really the main goal here is to increase access and availability of local regionally produced products. Um, for farmer's market promotion, this is really focused on direct markets. So farmer's markets, roadside um, stands, CSAs, um, getting those up and running or helping to strengthen, strengthen those programs. Um, our local food promotion program really supporting the development, coordination, and expansion of local and regional food businesses or intermediaries. Um, so really making sure that, you know, we can move product um, through food hubs, distributors, um, or with value-added um, production enterprises such as shared kitchens. Next slide. So to give you a few more details um, on these programs, the Farmers Market Promotion Program, it does have three project types. So we have the capacity building and the community development training and technical assistance, which I believe there's a number of you um, in the Central Appalachia region that have projects of these types. Um, we also have our brand new turnkey marketing and promotion um, project type this year, which we're really excited about. Um, and I'll, I'll share more details about that. As a quick uh, reminder, again, the, the FMPP is really focused on direct to consumer markets. Um, all projects must um, demonstrate a direct benefit to local farmers and ranchers, um, including new and beginning farmers. We also want to make sure that these programs support more than one farm. Um, this table that is on the screen shows each of the project types, their project duration, start and end dates, and also the maximum and minimums um, for each of these projects, um, as well as the match requirement, which I want to just put a reminder that that is cash or in-kind. Um, in-kind definitely should not be overlooked. So uh, just a quick, um, you know, synopsis of the, the different project types. Capacity building focuses on long-term organizational capacity of direct-to-consumer markets really sh or strengthening ex uh, existing markets. So this could be um, a variety of activities like training for farmers, ranchers, and market managers, or market startup, or market analysis, strategic plans, outreach um, to both vendors and customers, where the community development and technical assistance project is really focused on um, projects that engage a large and diverse set of stakeholders in activities, again, around outreach training and technical assistance. So this might be statewide projects um, focused on training farmers or farmers market managers or providing technical assistance on advertising or building networks um, of uh, producers to provide technical assistance or working on statewide brands. Last but not least, um, you will see the turnkey marketing and promotion project type in both the farmers market promotion project and also the local food promotion um, project. The purpose of this is really to streamline the application process. We have heard, um, you know, stakeholders' interest in making sure to simplify that process. Um, and this really focuses on making, you know, activities that we commonly heard in past applications um, focused on marketing and promotion activities. We give stakeholders a select set of five different activities. They must choose up to three of those activities. Um, they can't do additional activities beyond that um, that are prescribed either, um, but in in focusing on those activities, um, we will provide you with a streamlined application um, to make things a little bit simpler when applying for our program. And so those activities focus on things like market analysis, market planning, um, marketing and promotional, um, promotional activities with media, implementing a marketing plan, or even evaluating market and promotioning, promotion activities. Next slide. 
So I know Leslie is going to share a lot of examples from the region, but I wanted to make sure I provided at least one. Um, and I chose this one um, as I thought it was a little bit unique from some of the activities we sometimes see. Uh, this was the U.S. Farm Stay Association. They had a fiscal year 17 uh, farmers market promotion program. It was a um, capacity building project type. And what they wanted to do was to increase awareness about farm stays, farm and ranch stays across the United States. So their project really focused on providing training and technical assistance for new and existing farm stay operations. They also wanted to promote farm stays at farmers markets throughout the state of Oregon and also update their farm state website. So as a result of their project, um, they were able to reach more than 63,000 people at farmers markets. Um, they also saw um, 10,000 new individuals participate in farm stays for the first time. So that was really exciting. Um, through their grant, they also provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance um, to farms to be able to launch farm stays. And then they also redesigned their website. They also developed um, a new advisory board in the state of Oregon too, focused on farm stays and developed some cooperative agreements to continue to do that type of promotional activity um, at farmers markets throughout the state. Next slide. For local food promotion um, projects, this has four project types this year. Many of these you're going to be familiar with. Again, we have the new turnkey marketing and promotion um, project type. And then due to the ARPA funding, we also have our continued farm to institution project type. All of these projects, again, focus on intermediary markets, so developing food hubs, distributors, wholesale and processors, along with value added production enterprises, again, like shared kitchens and kitchen incubators. So very similar to the FMPP table you saw, this one again shows what are the different project types, the duration, start and end dates, and then again, maximum and minimums for each of these project types. And um, as you know, for FMPP and LFPP, again, the match requirements are the same. So again, in kind, um, as well as cash is accepted. For planning projects, it's just as it sounds, um, the plan, these project types can support the planning stages for local intermediaries. You can focus on activities like market research, feasibility studies, or business plans. For implementation projects, this is really establishing or improving new or existing local and regional food businesses. This could be, you know, online wholesale marketplaces or providing technical assistance as part of your work as an intermediary. The farm to institution project type is really um, focusing on expanding opportunities with institutions, whether that be hospitals, schools, jails, um, governmental facilities. So really making sure to try to create new inroads and markets there. And then again, we have the turnkey marketing and promotion. Um, it's the same application. It's a separate form than the other narrative application. Um, again, folks have to commit to do three of the five prescribed activities. And I do want to mention that for um, both of these programs, planning and implementation and farm to institution focus projects um, are also eligible to apply under the turnkey project type if they're focusing on marketing and promotion and meet all of the turnkey requirements. But, you know, if your promotion's focused on the farm to institution aspect, that's fine. You can still apply under turnkey marketing and promotion. Next slide. Uh, this is an example that actually might be familiar and some of you may have been involved in it. Um, so this is a fiscal year 17 local food promotion program um, grant that Green Umbrella received. So as you are likely familiar, Green Umbrella is a collective impact organization in um, Cincinnati, Ohio focused on sustainability, food and health in the region. They really wanted their their grant to focus on bringing two regional food hubs together to increase 
producer sales, increase GAP certified producers, and increase local sourcing in institutions and households. And so as a result, they were able to increase um, both their clients. They went from eight to 126, which is pretty impressive during the grant period. Um, they also increased the their baseline sales from 21,000 to over $700,000 um, during the project. Um, they also decided that um, it would make smart business if they were to share their warehousing storage and utility costs um, by co-locating the two uh, food hubs. So I thought that that was an interesting outcome that came from that grant project as well. Next slide. So just to clarify who is eligible, you can see all the organizations. So whether you're a producer coming from a food policy council, local government, um, entities must be owned and operated and located within the 50 states or the US territory. So nothing new there. Um, each of these entities is defined in the RFA. So make sure you're checking out um, that section of the request for applications. Next slide. We often got we often get questions on the types of costs that are allowable under under our grants, and so I just wanted to include a couple slides here on both allowable cost and ineligible cost. Um, this is also this information is also in the RFAs, FAQs, and our terms and conditions. But a couple reminders: salaries and benefits are allowable. Travel costs that. Um, are part of your project activities, marketing and advertising for the projects, um, materials and supplies that you might need um, to move the work forward, as well as equipment is allowable in certain circumstances, um, really focusing on, you know, general purpose equipment um, may not be purchased, but often can be rented. Um, it just needs to be a part of your approved budget or you need to have prior written approval. Um, some special purpose equipment is also allowable, again, as long as it's in your approved budget or you have prior written approval. Next slide. Examples of some of the costs that are not allowable. Um, FMLFPP cannot support activities that are not producer to consumer or focused on local food intermediaries. So just a quick reminder about that. Um, and that these activities really do need to benefit more than one agricultural producer. Um, but some of the items that typically aren't allowed are purchasing foods to be donated to entities or individuals, duplicate activities that may be um, covered in other federal award programs, Buildings or construction are currently unallowable, including things like nails, cement, boards, and then purchasing of food to resell or donate, um, production items, so seeds, hoop houses, um, and then also, of course, lobbying, fundraising, and financial campaigns. Next slide. So now we'll move to the can you go back one slide? There we go. Thank you. The Regional Food System Partnership Program. This is one of our newest um, additions to the LAMP programs. Uh, I know that there's at least three of these applications out there um, or projects out there in the central Appalachia. So exciting to see so much work happening. But this is our grant program that really supports um, connecting public and private partnerships and promoting planning around food systems um, and looking at how folks can scale up within a region. And so this is really intended for convening partners, improving communication and, and collaboration, also looking at how to, you increase economic opportunities. So really kind of more of the, the collective impact type of concept behind uh, local and regional food systems. Next slide. So who is eligible? This grant requires a formal partnerships. So there must be uh, two or more entities that are coming together to partner in a region. Um, an eligible entity can submit the application on behalf of the partnership, but they need to specify who is going to be the lead um, in the project. Um, the partners also get to define the region. Um, it can be, as you can see on the slide, it can be as big as, you know, small as a neighborhood, um, but it can be 
but it needs to be smaller than the entire country. Next slide. So when the partners come together, it is all about the planning or working together in a coordinated fashion to impl implement the plan. And so um, partnerships will be responsible for determining the size and scope of what they define as their local and regional food system. Also, what are their project goals? Um, what are they trying to advance and what are the activities that are going to help get them there? Um, You'll be working hand in hand with AMS on technical assistance that you might need for your region, um, including potentially linking to similar projects. Um, and then also conducting outreach and education um, to continue to build buy-in and support for the work um, and the activities in the region. Next slide. Um, the great thing about RFSP is that if you are an FM. LFPP grantee, you are eligible to apply to participate in RFSP grant projects. Um, and I know many of you are. And this work really shouldn't duplicate again um, your FM LFPP, but really you can still complement that work um, between FM LFPP and RFSPP. Next slide. RFSPP has three grant. Um, project types. This includes planning and design, which again, similar to its title, really focuses on the early stages of convening and organizing, doing the visioning type of work that a region may need. Implementation and expansion focuses on really building on prior efforts. So if you already have a plan in place, um, this can support the implementation of it or another grant down the road um, to support the implementation of work that you did under the planning and design phase. We also have our new farm to institution project type, um, which is really focused on how do you utilize and leverage that regional food systems planning to support farm to institution connections within the region. Next slide. So the thing that I really love about RFSP as someone who used to work on the ground is that the grant funds many of the things that we struggled with getting funding for. So um, RFSP is all about funding the development of the partnership. So the coordination of efforts, the outreach to partners, um, the time needed to sit in meetings together and to think through the planning of the work that you want to see for move forward. Um, it can support value chain coordination. Um, it can support grant writing, which I think is very different and unique from many USDA programs. So love to see people take advantage of that and can also look at exploring new partners and entities and also exploring what other funding opportunities might be out there as well. Next slide. So just a quick note on things, and I don't think any of these are going to sound, uh, are going to be shocking on activities that may not be eligible. Duplicate activities, of course, are not eligible with other federal funding sources. Um, this must benefit one or more agricultural producer. Um, the project should not depend on the completion of another project for this work to begin. We need to know that when the grant is awarded that you'll be ready to go. Um, no production related expenses, again, no construction. Um, also making sure that the funds don't support um, a revolving loan program or seed equity type of funding. Next slide. We do give priority consideration um, throughout the grant if um, partnerships are leveraging significant amounts of non-federal financial and technical resources. I saw that later in your agenda, you're gonna have some funders come in. So those are really exciting things that could be touted in potential grant activities. Um, also making sure that the area, we give priority consideration for projects that can sever areas of concentrated poverty or what we consider to be high impact investment areas and have a diverse set of partners. Next slide. So that is what I will share on the program content side, but a couple quick reminders, you know, these applications, we have three different programs that you can choose from. Highly encourage folks read um, through the entire uh, application before they get started to figure out really what fits them best. Next slide. Um, 
there we go. Um, also make sure that you get started early, um, at least a month in advance to make sure that you go through all of the different systems. Um, there are several steps that are required to get the application in the door, even beyond the project narrative. So I wanna make sure that folks have a, a lead, lead time on that and can get that done. Um, since we're May uh, second is coming sooner than one might, uh, uh, you know, hope for. Um, the time to start is really now, and all of these items are absolutely free to register. You know, for sam.gov for your account or to get started with grants.gov. Um, the application is again due May second uh, at eleven fifty nine. So hope you get started um, as soon as possible. And because it, people typically ask, um, I will say we do anticipate making awards once we have the applications in sometime around September or October twenty twenty three. Next slide. While this is not an AMS program, I did just want to mention it really quickly. Our partners at Rural Development have recently opened at the end of last week, the value added producer um, grant. And so they're accepting applications online through May 11th, um, paper applications through May 16th. Um, again, this program really focuses on economic planning activities and eligible working capital expanses to enable agricultural producers to produce and market value added products. This year they have 31 million available, which is a pretty significant pot of funds. Uh, so uh, please help get the word out for those that might be interested in the region. And I do have a tips and tricks slide. I don't think I need to go into this because we have so many people in the room who have had direct experience implementing these grants. You will have these slides if this is helpful to you, but I strongly recommend you know connecting with others um, who've been through this process um, several, not once, but twice or more um, you know, for successful awards. So a lot of great expertise in the room. And then did want to next slide. Just put out a call, you know, we are always looking for peer reviewers, we are always needing people that have food systems expertise um, and would love folks from the region to sign up. This is also a really great opportunity if you haven't applied for a grant and you want to learn more about the process. I think this is also a really great opportunity to learn more about how grants are selected and what applications look like. Um, but we have an open application period you can go to our website to find out more. Um, usually you're assigned about seven to 10 applications and get to work with others throughout the country, which can be a really um, fun opportunity as well. Next slide. Um, so I provided the link to our grants page here. You can find everything from the RFAs. You can find our seeds of success, which if you're not familiar that, with that, that's case studies on local and regional food system projects that have been funded through both um, the Farmers Market Promotion and Local Food Promotion Program. We have a stakeholder toolkit, which is all the like, if you want to skim to the key details about these grants, um, the open opportunities in these grants and key points. That's a great document to look um, through to find that information. There's also FAQs, our terms and conditions, which I briefly mentioned. So lots of information. And then you can always reach out if you can't find information or you have questions about other USDA programs that could potentially you know, benefit your work. You're, you're always free to, to contact me as well. And that is it. I'll open it to, to questions or hand it to you, Leslie. Well, thank you so much. This has been, it's so, it's so much nicer to see this in a slideshow. I mean, even though I think many of us are so familiar with these programs, you know, to see it sort of succinctly presented uh, within slides is, and charts is really, I know, helpful for me. I'm a visual learner, so um, it's of great benefit. Um, so I know I have a couple questions, but I thought I'd let the rest of the participants, uh, I see Martin has his hand up. Why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself, Martin? Thank you, Juliana. Uh, Martin Richardson, <laughs> Hi, Martin. Farm Alliance. And yes, we have taken advantage of uh, the LAMP set of, um, of grants extensively. I think we have an RFSP for Louisville as well as FMPP. Um, anyway, I just noticed that you all just sent out um, a notice about the ACER 
uh, grant. Um, oh, yeah. And, and Appalachia being a maple producing area, maybe you could mention that. We do have our acre. ACER Access and Development Program grant. This is a grant that really supports the maple syrup industry. Um, because you asked, about, asked me about this on the spot, I'm remembering some of the, I'm forgetting some of the details. We have about $6 million in the pot this year for funding. Um, I'll have to double check on when that grant opportunity closes, but I'm happy to put more information there. And one thing that's really nice about the AMS grant website that I will just, if you're not sure about what these projects look like, I highly recommend um, looking at past projects and awards. You can yeah. see who was funded and the different project summaries um, for these projects as well. And I'll put in a, an, a couple few more details in there as well. Oh, thanks. Martin beat me to it. <laughs> I need to be done by Monday and I'm going to be done. Hey, Ann, did you have a question? I see you're unmuted. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. No, and I don't know how I became unmuted either, honestly. <laughs> well, welcome. Well, yeah. We I have our friend from happened. rural development with us as well. Yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything about value-added producer grants. No, because uh, I can't top what Juliana already said. So thanks for the mention, by the way. But if you're in the state of Virginia, you now know who to go talk talk to if you're interested. <laughs> yes. there, 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 there you go. Exactly. Um, sitting right up here in the Appalachia region. So there you go. Well, thanks, right. Anne. Happy I'm going to hit you. mute again now. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Well, I am really interested in how you folks came up with this new turnkey program in both FMPP and uh, LF, uh, local food promotion program as well. Well, as I mentioned, I, I feel like it's not going to come as a shock to you and you all have probably been in some of the conversations where folks have asked us to streamline our application process. So. The grants division took a look at what were some of the common activities that people were asked um, across the grant programs and what they found out for farmers market promotion and local food promotion is that it was marketing. There was a number of marketing activities that many of the grant programs focused on. And so they really, again, analysis, took an analysis, aggregated that information um, and identified the common themes. And so there's still some wiggle room with it that I think is really nice to give people some flexibility to implement it in a way that makes the most sense, but you know, focused on the five activities that they found to be the most common across all of the applications. Mm -hmm. one, and, of, one of the hopes I have for that program now is I think many of us who are who are stronger. Uh, established anchor organizations in Central Appalachia, oftentimes we're the lead applicant for partners who maybe feel that they don't have the capacity uh, to be able to go out on their own for an application. And I'm feeling this new um, availability will maybe include folks who have not been applicants in the past is um, I think what we're hoping to nurture here in uh, our region, at least in southeastern Ohio, because a lot of times it's just been intimidating. If I'm a, yeah. even if I'm a mature farmers market association, um, you know, folks are like, "Oh, this seems, this seems really intimidating. Can I navigate this process?" Yeah, and we got the narrative form. So the narrative form is 15 pages, but for those of you who've been through the process or may not be super familiar with it, you need to utilize that form to actually, um, you know, apply for the grant and you can only add up to five additional pages to that. So I think if you look at it less than, if you look at it a little differently than it's not 20 pages, your grant application, but it's five pages of new content. Um, it seems a lot more easy to manage. Um, I will also say, you know, the grants division is really taking the attitude that this is the pilot year. It's the first time we've ever offered this. And it was in direct response to, you know, in, input and feedback we were hearing from folks on the ground. And so they wanna hear what you think. Um, and the grants division always has, you know, a call for anyone, whether it's someone who has successfully been awarded a grant or 
was simply, you know, interested in the process that they're willing to accept feedback and that information is on their grant um, website. And so please let us know what you think um, as you review that and talk to partners in the field that are interested in um, applying for the streamlined application this year. Anyone else? Well, I still have one more question. Sure. <laughs> so one of the things, I think one of the things that we're so excited about um, with this new program is uh, for-profit businesses actually being able to apply um, for funding. And I know that's been a possibility to the local food promotion program grant. Can And maybe I'm asking a question that's too difficult to answer, but anybody from USDA, please chime in. How, you know, how do we, I guess, balance the need as many of us wearing the non- a profit practitioner hat, making sure that the funding that we receive really reaches the ground and really uh, addresses some of the gaps that our for-profit food or farm enterprises have. You know, where where is USDA maybe headed? I, I feel like there's some um, interest, obviously, through this cooperative agreement for the Regional Food Business Center. Um, or even some of the Ag Innovation Center um, expectations in terms of deliverables. So how do we get more money um, to the ground, to the actual entrepreneurs doing, uh, creating new food systems within our regions? This is maybe a bigger philosophical question <laughs> this, this is <laughs> than a, anyone uh, wants to discuss <laughs> today, but I thought I'd put it out there. Uh, it, it's a great question. Um, Leslie, I will say that I, I will answer this from my own perspective. Um, yeah, okay. and, and maybe that's as far, you know, I think when we're talking about food systems funding and advancing this work in the field, I don't think that we can set, while we can categorize, there are different types of stakeholders that are out there in this work, nonprofits, of course. Um, but at the end of the day, we're talking about producers and farms, which are food businesses. We're talking about, you know, aggregators, food hubs. We're talking about distributors. They're all food businesses. So mm -hmm. there really is the majority of the organizations that are out there doing the work are doing this from, um, you know, a perspective. And even nonprofits are doing this. They're trying to figure out how do we keep the operation running and the doors open, um, but while how do we also make these types of products more readily available in the community? And, and many have a social, um, you know, initiative that they're trying to drive beyond that. And so one, I think with our regional food business centers, you do, you have, you know, the seed grants that'll be able to get out to food enterprises. And it's really supposed to be focusing on those funds that like, what is that, you know, up to $100,000, it could be very small sliver of funds that you need or a larger to, to help get your business to the next level or your operation to the next level. Um, again, you know, our grants can, in many cases, can support businesses in making the types of change, whether that comes through the support of a nonprofit that's helping them, you know, providing them the technical assistance to get there. But it's all about how do you make those food businesses and entities in your community thriving. And so I think, you know, even when we work on things like, and I saw Lisa Ong is on here in the Farm to School grant, like that is a grant program that's open to producers. Um, organizations often, you know, we'll see in those grant applications, maybe they're working with a local distributor or a local food hub. And depending on how they're structured, it might be a nonprofit, it might be a for-profit entity, um, could be a B Corp. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that we understand that these are business operations um, at the end of the day that need to make it work economically for their operation, um, while they also have more of a social, you know, community-driven um, imperative as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I mean, I think the lines are getting blurrier. You know, we see so many new businesses really operating as social enterprises, uh, more social enterprises now, I think, even forming as nonprofit sort of LLCs. So it uh, we need a diverse, I would say, ecosystem of these models. But at times, 
I know I hear from our processors, our producers, our farmers over and over again, you know, how do I secure funding? Um, oftentimes the the grant funding that then I can leverage additional loan products or maybe even venture investment. Um, because we really need, uh, I would say, extraordinary investment in infrastructure and equipment. Um, and I'm hoping we can see more of that on the horizon. So, yeah. And I will just say quickly about that, you know, as far as a part of the food systems transformation, there has been, um, you know, the secretary has put it out there. There's going to be at least a $600 million commitment that's really focused on um, equipment and infrastructure for programs, not for the meat and poultry in industry, but for everything else. So including produce. And we know that the infrastructure that may have once been in many communities is no longer that really supports local and regional food systems or needs to be for the first time. And so, you know, that is going to depend greatly on what the regional needs are and what they're trying to move. Um, so really knowing that we'll have to work pretty fluidly with communities on funding that, but it's specifically going to focus on that equipment and infrastructure piece. And, you know, the USDA is making a wide range of tools available. Not only do we have our grant programs like LAMP, um, we have a number of new new grant programs, but we now have revolving new revolving uh, loan programs. Um, there's just a lot of tools that we are, are really thinking on how do we support that, including cooperative agreements, you know, with organizations to try to get technical assistance out there needed even above and beyond um, just the regional food business centers as well. Um, and then we have a rural partners network with I'm sure many of your um, folks are very familiar with as well. Well, thank you so much. Is there any additional question or comment? from the group. I don't see anyone unmuting or raising their hand. <laughs> so I'm going to move us on. Um, so one of the things that I've prepared in many ways as a thank you to our friends at USDA, I went back and I combed through all the award announcements um, from 2017 to 2022 to again, excerpt just some of the projects that have been awarded funds from RFSP, uh, FMPP and LFPP. So I'm just gonna do a very quick slideshow. Um, folks are probably gonna see some of their programs uh, listed in the slideshow. Um, so I would definitely encourage people to go ahead and unmute and uh, share some additional information but I'm probably going to go through this uh, relatively quickly here. Let me get back to the beginning. Oh, it's like multitasking is not my good strength. <laughs> so these are just investments. Um, I'm going to start out with the farmer's market uh, promotion program. Um, and really cover, uh, again, just kind of a, a quick synopsis. So this is a recent award uh, to Community Farm Alliance uh, for the Farmers Market Resiliency Project. Uh, this is, again, a way to provide comprehensive market training, technical assistance, and peer-to-peer uh, -peer network uh, in Kentucky. And I don't know, Martin or Jennifer, you would maybe want to weigh in on uh, how this award is making a difference for you folks in Eastern Kentucky. Put everyone on the spot here. Yeah. This is Martin. Um, yeah, so, you know, we have uh, the Farmer's Market Support Program is now, let's cipher this out, but it's about six, eight years old. Um, and, you know, we continue to evolve that program. Um, <clears throat> You know, and the resiliency program is really kind of taking things to the next level of supporting uh, farmers markets, um, especially their boards and their managers to um, really address sustainability issues um, that they are facing and, and kind of bring them up into, you know, quote, uh, how to run a professional business, so to speak. Yeah, thanks for putting us on the spot here. Um, I'll let Jennifer talk about, and I'm sure you've got it, but there's another one, the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky has also got an FMSP that is much more specific. 
Yep, I think I got that covered as well. One of the things that I think has been remarkable for you folks with CFA and so many of the other Eastern Kentucky um, partners, and I know we covered this a lot um, and some at three, but just the fact that these peer networks were in place, I think really helped people mobilize uh, during the flood uh, and the aftermath of the flood, the continuing aftermath of the flood uh, in Eastern Kentucky. So uh, again, thank you for this work. It's been really foundational. Yeah, Leslie, I, I, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but right, you know, and we've had a number of floods uh, in East Kentucky, and then we had COVID too, right? And so, you know, we've been able to respond because of the human infrastructure that's been built through, you know, uh, the, you know, the FMPP or Armed Farm, Farmers Market Support Program, as well as you know, Kentucky Double Dollars. Um, that's through NIFA, um, you know, and that support. So that human infrastructure, you know, has been in place. And um, I don't think we, I think overall we undervalue that. But then when the floods happen, like we, and I mean that collectively, we're really able to pivot quickly um, and provide support as well as food and other stuff, um, you know, to that. And, you know, to the extent that we're able to mitigate that, um, you know, I, I think we're really proud of that. It was a bit of eye opening. And this is really Jennifer's forte. So I'm not going to take, <laughs> go and take her glory. So we'll catch Jennifer up here in a, a little bit too. Uh, and then another recent award in our region was to Rural Action. And again, this is a partnership between Rural Action, ACENET, and a number of other collaborators to launch the Shawnee Farmers Market. Um, we're getting ready to uh, open the season for the Shawnee Farmers Market again, um, but there's just been a lot of help uh, to really uh, organize the, the board, come up with membership agreements, uh, provide promotion. Uh, this is a, uh, located in a really small populated area in uh, Southern Perry County, uh, in many ways a food desert. So being able to really create a win-win model, both for farmers, processors, some of the other artisans now that are participating as members in this market has been fantastic. Uh, we have a poultry vendor who's in the startup phase. Uh, this has been a great opportunity. So win-win for customers, for farmers, uh, for processors. So again, thanks for that investment. Um, and then, you know, I do have a few favorites in terms of the, the partners that we work with. Um, I think one of the uh, extraordinary models that has been building for the last 10 years is through the Tri-State Local Food uh, Organization. Uh, many of us just know what they do as the Wild Ramp, uh, one of the premier social enterprise, sort of bricks and mortar year round farmers markets. Um, but they were just able to secure funding uh, recently to be able to create an annex for their online food hub, uh, warehousing and aggregation. It's sort of catty corner across the street from the Wild Ramp Marketplace. They just did not have the space uh, to be able to do an online food program or delivery. Uh, so this investment has really allowed them uh, to broaden their customer reach uh, recently as well. Uh, and then another example, I mean, a lot of this funding, whether it's been FMPP or LFPP, has been uh, an incredible investment in uh, food system infrastructure, uh, whether it's food hubs, uh, shared use, uh, food enterprise facilities, uh, you know, we run the gamut, I think, throughout central Appalachia uh, and try to connect these models as well. So the public market continues to grow regional agriculture. Uh, they have received many of the folks that uh, we're showing slides of have received multiple grants through the LAMP programs uh, as well. So whether it's an FMPP or an LFPP, 
uh, a lot of this funding has really accelerated uh, food systems within our subregions. Uh, here's the foundation for Appalachian Kentucky, again, uh, assisting with mm -hmm. the development of the North Fork uh, Local Food Promotion Program. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to let you um, have the microphone uh, for this project. Uh, thank you. Uh, this actually, this project builds on another uh, farmer's market promotion program we had had that um, I think was very instrumental in building that human, human infrastructure in our region that enabled us to respond effectively to the flooding. Um, this particular FMPP um, has as a large component of it outreach to the farmers we engaged um, with COVID and the 2021 flood disaster funds um, and um, to help them access resources and grow their businesses and connect to market channels. Um, unfortunately, we were hit with the 2022 flood. Um, so we have, uh, 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 we are needing to address that in order to move forward in um, with uh, growing our local food system, but I am thankful that we have this funding and this program and our partnerships to enable us to do that effectively. Great, thank you. And then um, this is the shameless promotion of uh, ACENET's uh, 2017 funding. And I just wanna do a huge shout out. Um, I think many people uh, participating in this call know that ACENET uh, has had a long, oh, like 35 plus history working with the Athens Farmers Market um, that actually just celebrated our 50th anniversary uh, last summer. Um, but for for really a, almost a, more than a decade, we have been working with the Market Association to secure a permanent home um, for both indoor and outdoor uh, vending space. So finally, after so much work was done uh, for this project, we were able to make that partnership happen with the city of Athens. So the market relocated um, where we had been in a sort of tenuous situation within the uh, mall parking lot where they kept uh, adding additional uh, outlet uh, buildings and our footprint kept shrinking. Uh, we now are safe and secure uh, at the Athens Community Center campus uh, since November. And that has allowed uh, market vendors to set up outdoors under the canopy of solar panels in the parking lot, as well as having uh, indoor space within the community center as well. Um, this has also allowed us to do a lot of planning in conjunction with the Athens Art Guild so that that marketplace also co-locates now uh, on the community center campus. So it's it's finally come to fruition. I kept saying I can't retire until this project gets completed. So now, you know, I guess I could retire, but I won't. <laughs> I think I saw a hand raised, Martin. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that's a long list. I do want to shout out some other folks. I mean, we are part of a uh, number of other lamp um, land grants in Kentucky, um, take hard, um, uh, Allie is on here, we take hard, um, has, has or has had an LFF, LFPP, um, an RFSP, uh, we partner with the Fort Council, Kentucky Horticulture Council on an FMPP. Um, I already mentioned our RFSP for Louisville um, work. And Lord, I'm sure I'm forgetting uh, some folks too, but there's the lamp, the lamp collection of grants has really been instrumental, uh, I think, in really building out the local regional food system. Yeah, and that's where the again the lines get a little blurred here, Martin. So many of uh, these awarded projects have had uh, many of the Central Appalachian Network uh, partners as sub-recipients. Um, so sometimes it gets a little confusing. I will say, and probably our friends at USDA know this, 
Uh, we try to take turns sometimes within Central Appalachia in terms of who is the lead applicant and then who are the collaborative partners. It might be a, in an LFPP and it's certainly in the RFSP. Um, I did want to sh do a shout out to God's Pantry. Um, this food bank project has also started to connect with some of the work um, that many of us in a shared uh, RFSP um, program have been fostering a larger sort of distribution corridor throughout Central Appalachia. And God's Pantry is uh, becoming a, a stronger partner within that distribution network. Uh, ASD, also probably a familiar organization um, throughout Central Appalachia, headquartered in Southwest Virginia, operators of the Appalachian Harvest uh, Food Hub. Uh, they recently were awarded uh, to uh, hopefully distribute and build more of a local beef value chain in Central Appalachia. Uh, through Appalachian Harvest, they have these longstanding relationships with mid-tier wholesale buyers. So now we're seeing uh, more of the regional uh, beef products going into uh, their uh, sort of market partnerships with a number of larger grocery store chains, as well as uh, I think we're on the, um, the early stages of getting more meat products distributed uh, throughout Central Appalachia uh, into farm and school markets as well. And then the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition. Uh, this again is a relatively uh, recent award uh, to really promote value-added products uh, throughout West Virginia. Um, I do a lot of work in West Virginia, uh, strong partnership between ACENET and the West Virginia Farmers Market Association, also um, really focused on the development and distribution of more value-added uh, product lines throughout West Virginia. And then the Natural Capital Investment Fund. Uh, we're going to hear from Martin Jenkins here uh, later in the summit or in a little bit. Uh, this is now Partners Community Capital. They did go through a name change in the last 15, 16 months, um, but they've been a longstanding partner and have been funded uh, in a number of ways through the LAMP grants to really uh, focus on uh, value chain coordination to enhance both direct and wholesale uh, market opportunities in West Virginia. And then there's been, I think, such a focus, and we see in many of these war awards, on um, how do we get more local and regional beef, uh, especially into wholesale markets. So Buzz Foods, um, many folks have known them uh, headquartered in Charleston, West Virginia for many years. They've recently secured funding uh, through the LAMP program, but also have used this to leverage uh, considerable additional uh, investment uh, to expand wholesale markets. Um, so really creating more of a livestock value chain throughout West Virginia. So instead of many of the farmers just um, raising animals for more of a, a cow-calf uh, supply chain. Uh, this creates more processing uh, capacity in West Virginia for wider distribution. And again, I think our hopes um, are to see more meat uh, within farm to school programs as well. And then one of the, uh, oh, I think it was 2017, maybe 2018, uh, I can't remember, maybe it's more recent than that, awards again, I guess this is a little shameful promotion here for ACENET. Uh, we secured funding to do some uh, mobile slaughter and processing opportunities uh, in not just Ohio, but throughout Central Appalachia. So I would direct you to acenetworks.org. We have a whole section on the reports, uh, the feasibility analysis, some of the presentations we did. And then recently, uh, Chris and Adam on our staff visited with one of our entrepreneurs in uh, Adams County, who has actually been able to secure investment and has just launched uh, a mobile processing unit. So that's pretty exciting. And then just uh, as uh, Juliana had mentioned, uh, we have received uh, a couple of different awards. 
um, for the Regional Food System Partnership grants. Uh, most recently, ARC and D uh, received funding for the Northeast Tennessee Food Vision. And I don't know, Kayla, um, if you want to say maybe a, a few words about this project. Sure. Um, so I'm the project director for this project, and um, it's a implementation uh, grant, and we are focusing on improving the food system in the eight counties of Northeast Tennessee. So increasing access to consumption of and local investment in the local food system. Um, one of our first objectives was to establish a food policy council for our region which we have just done. And we've had two meetings so far. Um, we've got about um, eight folks um, committed to participating on it so far. Um, and we're trying to expand that and get more folks to the table, specifically more farmers um, and more um, community leaders. Um, one of our county commissioners is involved on the council, which we're very, um, very thankful for and very excited about. Uh, but yeah, it's just, we're just getting rolling and we're really excited about it. Thanks, Kayla. And then the other recipient was K Card. Uh, again, I think this was maybe in the first, I think the first round of RFSP uh, partners uh, with K Card uh, secured funding. And then we also secured funding with uh, Appalachian Sustainable Development as a uh, lead partner. Um, and I don't think I've seen anybody from uh, K Card. Uh, on the call yet. I don't know, Jennifer or Martin, do you want to say hey, anything Leslie. about this project? Or who's here? Hey, Leslie, it's Allie. Oh, Allie, you're there. Okay. I didn't see you. Yeah, yeah Allie, um, could you say a few words? Yeah, I can and talk a little bit about it. Um, so KCARD received funding for an LFPP grant in 2019, um, just ahead of COVID-19. Um, but over the last three years, we've worked to build a statewide reach to um, connect Kentucky producers, Kentucky local producers with buyers in the region. And I just want to give a shout out to CFA, a really big partner with us and has headed a lot of the efforts in the Appalachian region. Um, so we've done a lot of farm to school work in that region as well. And uh, if Jennifer wants to um, speak to that, um, that would be great. Could you repeat that last part, Allie? I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Jennifer. Um, I, I was just saying that CFA has done a lot of um, the lead on, on the LFPP in the Eastern region. Um, and if you'd like to include anything on that, that would be great. Okay, sorry. I just missed that. <laughs> sorry. Um, I was, no yeah, no, I was reading the chat. Um, uh, we have, um, again, I think that um, a lot of that has gone to help build our infrastructure and um, uh, strengthen our capacity to, uh, help farmers produce and then connect with market channels. And I know um, over the last eight months um, that this resource in particular has been instrumental in helping to pull together different organizations um, to uh, yeah, deal with flood fallout as well as help us to uh, prepare and to better prepare for future disasters, um, since we know at some point we're going to be flooded again. I'm wondering if you guys can talk about just all the different events that you as partners and, and other collaborators have hosted. I'm, I'm just always amazed. Maybe it's just because I'm always on the phone on a Zoom call with somebody from Kentucky and there's like, um, a, a conference or an event that you're hosting. It just seems like you guys have yeah. really accommodated a lot of peer exchange um, in this space. So so one of the um, upcoming events, Leslie, thank you for um, the opportunity to plug 
Um, next week, we'll be having the Kentucky Local Food Systems Summit, which is a partnership between um, University of Kentucky, um, the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, and KCARD. Um, and we'll be having a full day of sessions on value chain coordination and the local food system in Kentucky. And I'm sure there, there will be many people from the Appalachian region who will be joining us as well. And um, so that's one of the events that we've been participating in for the last few years. And then um, we've, we've also um, hosted grow a buyer meetups, which have been great for producers to meet with buyers in several different regions. Um, over the last two years, we've been able to set up at the um, Kentucky Eastern, the Kentucky, the Eastern Kentucky Farmers Conference. I always mess that up, um, but that's been a great way for um, farmers in the Eastern Kentucky region to meet with um, a lot of local buyers, um, wholesalers, and uh, restaurants and grocery stores um, in that locale. And if I may add, and Martin put this in the chat too, the Eastern Kentucky Farmers Conference has been going on in various regions or various places throughout Eastern Kentucky since 2017. Um, KCARD, uh, Community Farm Alliance, Grow Appalachia have been um, some of the key partners in that, along with a number of other folks. Um, but this has really been a great conference to um, help small scale farmers in the mountains hear about small scale farming in the mountains, um, which is different, as you all know, from other places. And it's also been I think a fabulous way to develop some leadership among farmers in our region. Um, we've seen farmers who were attendees a couple of years ago who are now leading workshops and um, talking, sharing their experiences with um, feeding cattle or growing in a high tunnel or whatever the case may be. And so um, it's just, it's really, there's really great synergy. Um, and if y'all can't tell, it's, it's my favorite conference of the year. <laughs> So <laughs> we appreciate that and thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm just amazed at how many events you handle. Um, you know, it's a busy, to, it's always busy, I think, for us, but I recognize that it seems like there's so many different um, farmer uh, events or convenings or conferences in January, February, and March. So to be able to, to manage those events, I think is is great. Um, I know we've had a number in Ohio uh, over the last month or two. So then my last slide is uh, one of the original awards for Appalachian Sustainable Development. Uh, this has been a value chain um, partnership between many of uh, our organizations in the Central Appalachian Network. Uh, ASD has been the lead, um, but the Appalachian Center for Economic Networks or ACENET, um, when, when this grant program first became available, uh, Kathleen Terry Baker and I were scheming as to how can we use this new opportunity of funding to really invest in some of the distribution network um, uh, model that we had originally secured Appalachian Regional Commission uh, Power Grant Award uh, investment for. So this has been a partnership um, really with longstanding CAN members, but it's also welcomed uh, new partners, some of them also uh, being previously funded through the LAMP programs like Sprouting Farms and the Troon Row Collective. Uh, we've had uh, West Virginia University also at the table in this project, as well as KCARD uh, and uh, the Ohio Cooperative Development Center helping uh, build perhaps a multi-stakeholder cooperative, uh, probably maybe a, a bigger bite for us to chew off even in uh, a three-year timeline for this grant. Uh, but we're about ready now to launch at least a uh, single member uh, co-op here this summer. 
we've been doing a lot of learning circles around cooperative development. So again, thanks to KCARD and Ohio Cooperative Development uh, as partners. Um, but this has really taken a lot of the distribution to the next level. I know it's uh, benefiting uh, some of our processors, Snowville Creamery, uh, Frog Ranch Foods, Shagbark Seed and Mill. Uh, we've been able to get product lines into West Virginia uh, distribution in a way that we haven't, it hasn't been possible uh, through private uh, distribution channels. Um, if you've uh, been following, I would say, any of the, the social media uh, from Coalfield Development, from ASD, from uh, ACENET, you'll know that we've just recently launched uh, some additional uh, marketing and promotion uh, for the distribution collaborative uh, through uh, supporting uh, Appalachia uh, Facebook page. Uh, we're in the process here at AceNet. Avery, our multimedia designer, as one of the actors within this model, is now creating a, a website. And Brianna, I think, Brianna, are you still on? Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you could say maybe a few words on some of the activities um, between sales and marketing and the distribution uh, logistics for this. So I'm not sure. I know you've had maybe some <laughs> connectivity problems um, as well, but Brianna. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, great. <laughs> You can talk about this more intelligently in terms of some of the recent uh, accomplishments we've had. Yeah, so um, we're really trying to launch this marketing campaign um, as um, the distribution network is looking to expand. Um, just trying to think strategically about where we're going to go next and then how we are going to promote and make that um, connection with people who would be purchasing in those areas um, to really emphasize local food. And um, yeah, I'm just excited to get like that foundation started with the marketing efforts and hoping as we expand, we're able to leverage off of that. I think what's really exciting for me, and I know this is extremely um, important and a high priority um, for our friends at USDA, uh, we've just had much greater success working with our K through 12 school districts throughout the region, getting um, more local food uh, sourced um, from, and their purchasing power is enormous. Uh, we'd like to see more of those market partnerships um, accelerate. And then we've had a lot of success uh, with our healthy food access partners as well. Um, we're really excited here in Ohio to see the purchasing um, through our Ohio Association of Food Banks, as well as our regional Southeastern Ohio um, Food Bank uh, purchasing more products. So that's gonna wrap us up um, for this um, part of our USDA information. I'm wondering, I've been stalling a little bit for time, um, but I see that uh, Kenya has joined us now. And I think uh, some other of our farm practitioners from uh, Rural Action. Um, but before we segue into the next uh, session, thank you, Kenya, for uh, joining us. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any final comments or any further questions for our folks here on the call, especially maybe our USDA folks. Leslie, I just want to say the portfolio of work that you all have been able to produce through the LAMP grants, and I know there's other USDA funds and other public and private funds that have contributed to helping you all in implement your vision is just really impressive. Um, you know, and I can't stress enough, I'm personally passionate about the human capital and network development. So again, if anyone's written anything on some of your work or case studies, would love to hear more about that. We know that networks are so important to facilitating and, you know, um, moving this work um, as fast as possible. So uh, glad to hear that and how it ties into resiliency and disaster preparedness, um, but also just, you know, 
not only does AMS put out funding, but we also have, and I saw Maria Graziani is on the, the line today. She's from our local and regional foods systems division, which has a research branch, you know, always looking to really uplift and highlight um, practical examples and information that can help other communities to really be able to organize and to implement strategies that are going to accelerate the local and regional food systems and your distribution network. We were just having a conversation about distribution yesterday. Um, so love to hear more about some of the organizing efforts um, that you're all using to be able to scale up and connect to institutions. So just, I just wanted to say, you know, on the USDA's behalf, like there's nothing more gratifying than seeing how this money is being put to use in the community to make real change. So thank you so much for sharing this work. <laughs> well, thank you for the acknowledgement. Um, you know, CAN's been at this since 1992, but I feel as, as the old timer um, since the beginning of the network formation that things are, the momentum has really built. And with new funding through the Biden administration, you know, whether it's been ARPA funding or just the whole federal family of different programs. I mean, we're able to secure money that we haven't been able to secure in the past. So I feel um, that as partners between practitioners and funders, we can really move the needle here. And we are, we are doing that, but I, I'm gratified to see that I think there's going to be much more accomplished and accelerated in the next couple of years. So that's exciting. Um, but let's hear from some farm folks. <laughs> so, you know, we've been talking, Kenya. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you for having me. Oh, no problem. Um, we really want to hear from, you know, folks in the field. Uh, what um, what opportunities, I guess, are you seeing? And, and maybe what are some of the challenges or gaps um, that farmers are experiencing throughout central Appalachia? You know, where do we need policy change? Um, where do we need to come together and maybe lift our voices to make this work and make these models more visible? So I'm going to let you have Great. the microphone. <laughs> okay. I didn't prepare a, any kind of a background for you all or, or even a slideshow. I'm sorry for that. And I'm late today. Forgive me. Today is the first day of the holy month of Ramadan. So Ramadan okay. Mubarak to everyone. And I woke up at three o'clock this morning and slaved over <laughs> with my children for making sure they could eat and they're fasting. So went back to sleep and I shouldn't have done that. So I just popped up out of the bed. And if I look like it, it's because it's true. <laughs> but well, anyway, we are I'm delighted not... to have you under the circumstances. <laughs> all that in the life of a farmer. So right. um I, I'd like to begin just with, you know, the the structure of what we do here at Slack Market Farm. So if anyone doesn't know about our farm, we do a raw milk production and we have a herd share and it really is a community based uh, farm. Everything that we've built on this farm has been through our community of herd share owners who have supported us and, and had my back the, the whole way through. And Farming is it's really hard to do as a beginning farmer. It really just, I tell everyone, it shouldn't be this hard to be a farmer. Um, just to start farming. It just shouldn't be this hard. We're, it's not rocket science what we do. And just about anyone can do what we do. It's just really hard work, you know, and, and takes diligence and all of that. But just to get your foot in the door and actually survive it um, and have a viable farm. It's, to me, it's like the three stages of the um, first, well, the three phases of the first stage of labor and delivery um, for a woman, because it just felt like that. It, it, when you first, your first year would be like that first phase, you're having light contractions <laughs> and you feel like, oh, this is going to happen. And, you know, it's rough, but then it's not so bad. But then the second year is that second phase when it starts, those contractions start hitting you and they're slamming in. And there's like physical pain, literally, like you're being ripped financially back, you know, just just back to back with things that you can't afford. Um, and, and you're feeling like it's time to get the bag and go to the hospital. And hopefully you packed a bag, you know, hopefully you have a support partner that that's took those reading classes with you and a team of people literally that's waiting for you to catch you in the wing. And then here comes the third phase where you're, you know, you're strapped to that 
bed with your legs up in stirrups and you're getting ripped front to back literally like wide open because your finances are just depleted and you're left then with a choice to push and thank god we've had a team that told me to push literally like held my hand put the rag on my head <laughs> sewed me up when it was all over <laughs> like literally we birthed something that we have now that's a living vibrant uh farm, but that doesn't happen for everyone. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people just can't make it through that part and they end up with a stillborn. And, you know, it's just, it's, it just, that's the best way to me to explain it because that's how it goes most of the time. And most farmers starting out make it through the first three years. And we all know that, but as a black farmer, um, it's the same as the statistics for, you know, us as black women birthing a child. You know, we, we have a, a more of a death rate, higher death rate for the mother, for the, the child and all the things. This is true as a farmer, a black farmer, especially. I tell people all the time we should be listed on the endangered species list as black farmers should be listed there. I, I'm certain that I've shared numbers. I know that you've probably all heard numbers and know like where we're at in this um, industry. And those continue to, you know, think that the statistics are just there and it just continues. And we, our policy work is so important for everyone that's in our industry because it's, it's what makes the needle move. It's, it's what helps. Even though like there is not perfect, like there's a lot of things that the USDA has recognized since 97, you know, they're, they're working on this and that for, for uh, what do they call it, socially disadvantaged farmers. You know, it, it's, it's still not enough though, um, compared to, I feel like it's, it's like the relief that's given is, is like a mile wide, but it's only an inch deep. And when you actually look at who it really helps, it's it's actually not the black farmer, not as much. Um, we're still low in the numbers of who gets the actual relief from those efforts. And so it's like other minorities still come first, but yet we're the ones who were, you know, we were the ones who who were offended. The offense was given to, when when this happened, you know, with our agriculture and slavery and um, all of the discrimination over these years and all the things that they know went wrong um but yet it's it's truly not fixed and so that's that's the fight however it's hard to continue to fight for that when you're still trying to keep your boat floating and keep things stay alive keep this child growing <laughs> feed the baby you know that that you've just it's just really hard to get all of that in one thing. And so the support of folks who do this work is important for that reason as well. Um, our rights as farmers, small farmers, period, like our right to farm is like literally on the line. We are at a point where corporations are just completely taking our industry. It's, it's in the fishing industry. It's everywhere as far as our food goes. And I know that what we do, we only have a right to do because of our raw milk law in Kentucky. And someone stood up and said, we need a raw, or we need a um, law for raw milk in the state. And there are farmers that went to jail to do what I do. You know, I, I have old timers that look at me and they see me on TV and I'm on there, you know, skirting and dancing, talking about my milk. And they contact me like, you better be careful, you know, because they've gone to jail for this. Um, but that we do, thank goodness, we have policy that came forward for us. And we have to continue to make policy for small farmers to do what they do and to support the small farmer or they're going to die out. We are really all at risk of losing what what we have. However, that takes community as well. And, and it needs to be community farming. That's the only way we're going to get back to our strength. Nothing can be anymore where you're just it's just you I've learned that I have now a team of milkmaids that are all beginning farmers that they come each one milks milks one day a week and they take their payment of you know for their work they I don't pay them money they take their milk but they're learning skills they're they're doing things on this farm that they couldn't get anywhere else I don't think anybody's you know 
looking at this like, oh, I'm working for free. It's just they're taking what I can give them, what I can teach them, and we're building this community. And we're looking at land access around us to become a little bit bigger. We don't want to be too big for our pants, but there's 250 acres that wrap us. That's air property that's been passed down to people who have no interest in agriculture, yet they have a farmer that tends that land and he's what, 60, 67, something like this. He's ready to retire here in a few years. And so we want to pass the torch. However, you know, he, is, he too is, that's an asset that we're going to lose. We're all talking about this 60 year old white man that, you know, is the standard of what agriculture is, but that 60 year old guy like has a skill set that I don't have. I, I, I don't have what he has and I need to learn it. And so we're trying to work with our farmer, Alan, just to go help him run some cattle, you know, conventionally like he does, like not my favorite thing, but we want to know how to raise hay with Alan. We would like to just, we're trying to transition that so that we can get access or gain access to that when he's ready to stop or, or just continue with us possibly. Um, but even that process is very difficult because the landowners, there's nothing for them to like look at and identify like, oh, this could work. They, We've had to hold a lot of hands with each one of them. It's several family members. Some of them are against it. They want to sell it. They want the money. They don't, they have no attachment really to the land. It's more about the money. The other side of the family is like they, they are attached and they do want to see what we're doing come to provision. So but if there was a program available to kind of walk people through and say, this is how we do this and, and explain issues and even like the insurance thing seems to be a big issue for them. But just for us, this group of people on my farm, we have this limitation. You know, there, there's land across the street that I have worked with my neighbor who owns that and we run our cows over there. She is looking to move, but wants a developer to come along and buy her land. She wants high dollar, and we're in an area where you'll get high dollar for your land out here. It's very valuable, high priced land. And so, talking with her and trying to figure out how we can access that or own that, not that I want to own it. Honestly, I don't. I'd rather just control it, <laughs> and honestly, just to be able to make sure things are not, there's not chemicals being sprayed across the street. And just to work it would be nice. But, and there's a slave house, God forbid, if she sells that to a developer, there's a slave house on her land that stands, had chains in it, like slaves live there in this little house. And it's such a wonderful thing for me to be able to take black people to my farm, show them what a black woman's doing, and then walk them to that slave house, you know, and, and it just really speaks to what this land represented at one time. Time, what it did, what we're doing now. However, our dreams, my little crew, we 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 really have only a certain amount of like money and a certain amount of ability for what we can do, but we know what we want to do. And it's not just for us, you know, it's to start beginning farmers on their way. There has to be a way to to transition land, credit. I, I was able to purchase our land this year. This past year in November, we bought our land with a USDA loan. That wasn't the easiest process. I mean, I went from May, I think I applied in May, and we finally got the loan in November. And I really believe like the only reason they were so careful not to like do any kind of dirt with me is because of who I am. Like everybody knows who I am now. And, and I even told them, you don't want to deny me this loan. Like <laughs> you really don't want to do that. But it was, you know, they were very thorough, did their jobs, but there are such limitations in that. Even like for me to qualify, I had to have income that would match my, I had to have farming income from a production that would match my loan of payment amount. So my hurt your income had to bring in at least $1,400 a month. How, if I'm a new beginning farmer, how in the world am I supposed to, any new beginning farmer, what kind of crap is that, that I would have to have a production if I'm trying to buy a farm and I, if I happen to have that production because I lived here five years, but if, if I was new coming in the door, that just, it just limits you to be able to buy land. So, you know, 
there's changes that need to be made and things that need to be addressed, but only we can do it. Only we can stand up and make these changes. And, and if people aren't willing to do that, I suggest you get out the game because it's coming to a point where we have to stand up for the small farmer. We're going to lose our small farmers and people are dropping off left and right. Like their farms are, are going, there are corporations and brokers and people calling every day willing to buy my place, you know, and, and it's, it's just staggering when you look at, like, I've spoke to an Alaskan native who tells me he was a fisherman, now he's a farmer, but all of his tribes, men, he represented three tribes, they don't know how to farm, but they have to farm because they can't live by the way of the salmon anymore and fish. And Alaska's permafrost is melting and how they all have to figure out, they're trying to do the best they can and make like maybe possibly reindeer farming, things like this. And I'm listening to this man and I thought, wow, like they're about to be like, what's happened to us, what's happened to native indigenous people is about to, ha it's still happening now. It's about to happen to them. And you see who's buying land in Alaska. You can look and see who's buying up the land in Alaska. <laughs> So anyway, there has to be people who are going to stand up right now and do what's right and push. And, and if you don't want to be the one pushing, then you need to be on the side of that person wiping her face when she's crying, <laughs> putting that rag on their head and his head or whatever and holding their hand, getting up to get this work and that's all for today. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> we I think I'm at my 10 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> but thank you, you for great. allowing me to, to share with you. Thank yeah. you. No, we so appreciate the the passion and the compassion you bring to this work. I mean, you're such a strong advocate. Um, we know that it's a lot to shoulder, you know, just what you've accomplished for your family, your community, and just representing, you know, the struggles of so many Black farmers, but just, you know, rural folks in Appalachia mm -hmm. trying to farm. Um, so thank you again. Thank um, you. I'm, I'm going to quickly segue <laughs> um, to, to Katie, um, one of the Rural Actions uh, Sustainable Ag um, managers. And I think, again, taking, you know, these needs, um, uh, to other, you know, to uh, influence some of the policymakers. So I'm wondering, Katie, if you can just talk a little bit about the delegation that went from Rural Action to D.C. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. I mean, Kenya talked about, you know, the the challenges of climate um, now uh, affecting um, farmers in rural America. So, Katie, maybe just maybe a quick three to five minutes possibly <laughs> yeah we'll see we'll see what i can do um okay. hi everyone i'm katie lloyd i'm the beginning farmer outreach specialist at rural action as leslie said i had the privilege of going to dc uh between march 6th and 8th for the farmers for climate change action rally for resilience um which was a, a great experience it essentially revolved around the farm bill which if you aren't aware is set to expire in september of 2023 um it's a massive omnibus um law essentially bipartisan law that has impact on farming livelihoods how food is grown and the kinds of food that we are growing in the u.s um the majority of it actually about 75 percent of that goes to nutrition benefits like snap uh but the other quarter of the pie goes to other various things like agroforestry work, conservation, commodities, crop insurance, things like that. Um, so as a nonprofit organization, we were a little unsure as to whether this was something that we could do if we could have meetings with legislators. And we discovered, you know, if as long as we're just doing education and sharing our farmers stories and not telling people to vote a certain way, it is perfectly acceptable for us to have meetings with uh, Senate staff and policy advisors. So we decided to go up. We lucked into a meeting with uh, policy advisors for J.D. Vance along with OFA. Um, 
which was a great experience, as well as a more uh, one on one uh, meeting with a policy advisor for Bill Johnson's office, who's a representative for Ohio's sixth congressional district. And we were able to meet with him, as well as um, another farmer from that district, Sophia Bugs, who's a farmer in Youngstown, Ohio. Um, our big asks for those meetings um, are essentially promoting soil health and climate resilience through conservation policy, increasing investments in local and regional food systems, addressing consolidation in the food and agriculture system, investing in organic and sustainable research, and providing more support for beginning and BIPOC farmers, which is the part that as a beginning outreach specialist, I really stressed. So we gathered some stories from farmers in our region, uh, specifically in the districts that these um, advisors represented and shared those stories with these advisors. And overall, it was a pretty good experience. You know, I think that these advisors are used to hearing from lobbyists from large ag organizations and not normally, you know, smallholder farmers experiences and, and how they interact um, with these resources. I'm particularly thinking of land access as an issue is something that we pushed during the meeting, um, as well as making access to grants and loans a little bit easier to navigate. Um, as I'm particularly often hear from beginner farmers, a little bit like Kenya said, these processes are not the easiest. Uh, to get to get money to get started, it can be really a little overwhelming at first, especially as a beginner farmer, first generation farmer. Um, so we were able to share those stories with these um, policy advisors, and I think we we made an impact, and it was a really great experience. It was my first time ever doing anything like that, but um, I felt like we were able to represent farmers in our region um, and make a little bit of change. So. Willing to take any questions? I don't know if that was two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Tried my best. Well, you know what, Katie and Kenya, we just so deeply appreciate um, all the folks who made the recent trip um, to DC. Um, I mean, I, we can't ask for better representatives in terms of, you know, really sharing what often seems invisible here uh, to outsiders in central Appalachia. So I want to thank you, you know, for your advocacy. Um, but I am going to be the, the ruthless facilitator here and keep us moving. Um, <laughs> if folks want to talk more uh, to Katie or Kenya, you can reach out to Kenya through CFA. Um, you can reach out to Katie through uh, Rural Action. And again, um, I would encourage people um, to go a little deeper um, with these gals to be able to find out more uh, in terms of what's happening. Obviously, Central Appalachia, we're gonna lift our voice um, in terms of the farm bill. Um, many of us have already uh, been working on that and we'll be talking more uh, throughout the summit here today. We'll have some more of our uh, policy partners um, addressing here uh, at the uh, final sort of 12 o'clock agenda item. But what I'd like to do right now is turn our attention um, to Bale and Campbell um, and from Invest Appalachia. Uh, we're going to do a, a deeper dive now with some of the funders investing in food system solutions, because obviously we can't do this alone as a uh, uh, mere practitioners or farmers or food processors, uh, we also need our investors. So Balin, I think you should have permissions uh, as a co-host to be able to show your own slides. Do you want to check that? It looks like looks it's like I've got yep. those. Give me one second, folks. Um, and great to be with everyone. Um, so again, Balin from Invest Appalachia. Presumably coming to us, maybe from Eastern Kentucky, although I know Balin travels, <laughs> so I'm not sure where he might be immediately today. So yeah, take think, it away. Uh, today I am home, thankfully, uh, calling in from Hazard, um, just a few stones throws away from Jennifer Weber. Um, but happy to be with everyone today and uh, so great to be hearing about all the amazing work that you all are doing. Uh, I am the Director of Community Impact with Invest Appalachia. 
which is a new regional blended capital impact investing fund, which is a lot. So I'll get into explaining all of that. Um, but um, we are a um, new impact investing fund that serves the entire central Appalachian region or the ARC's footprint of that. So that's the Appalachian counties of Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, all of West Virginia, North Carolina, North Carolina, uh, and Ohio. Um, and this slide is very much speak, uh, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but we were designed over a, um, over a five year strategic planning and design process to identify, uh, to identify gaps in the region's investment ecosystem to design investment products that to fill those and overall using a model that is deeply collaborative and tailored to work within central Appalachia, uh, specifically rural communities in our region. Um, this model was um, also inspired and designed off of a lot of international development models for impact investing, drawing inspiration from other rural and mountainous regions around the world to, to really understand about what would work here and how do we put community um, in, in the driver's seat. Um, we have uh, four priority sectors, that's clean energy, creative placemaking, community health, and food and agriculture. And there's a broad swath of projects um, that are um, in alignment under all of those uh, four sectors. These were all, these sectors were identified using a social determinants of health analysis on the central Appalachian region. Um, so our goal is to invest in rural communities to create healthier communities, to create sustained community wealth, um, and coming from a nonprofit and movement background, um, um, our goal is to, uh, to build community power and, and at the same time to ensure that um, we can build, um, build greater connectivity across the region and um, ensure that Appalachia has uh, as we look into the future, as we look at um, uh, the forthcoming impacts of the climate crisis that Appalachia is in the driving, the driver's seat to write its own next chapter. So how do we do this? Uh, so we are a blended, it's a blended model. So that's a mix of private investment dollars that are concessionary um, from a variety of investment partners uh, that is mixed with grant-like dollars that we refer to as catalytic capital. And those grant dollars are used to absorb risk and to, uh, in a variety of ways, um, ranging from technical assistance to providing credit enhancements for specific projects. Uh, so that a project that is investment worthy, um, but isn't quite ready to take on those uh, investment dollars, we can move a project along a continuum uh, to where they're investment ready. Um, and we uh, hope to be a partner along that entire continuum for projects that we're working with. Um, so we have a 501c3 that manages our grant-like dollars or catalytic capital and an LLC investment fund where the private investment uh, sits and is managed. Um, but an essential component of that is social capital, uh, working collaboratively with uh, regional, the region's CDFIs, community foundations, businesses, uh, and most importantly, practitioners. Um, here you'll see um, all the logos of all the folks uh, in the region um, that were key partners in the design of Invest Appalachia, as well as collaborative pipeline partners. So IA is meant to help leverage investment in many cases. So um, in many of our deals, we're not the primary investor. Our goal is to work with uh, your local CDFI, um, sometimes um, local and regional banks uh, to help absorb risk uh, to advance um, the um, to advance the growth and development of specific projects. Um, so over the next, Invest Appalachia has a uh, estimated fund term of five to seven years. 
Um, and the overall goal is that we will raise uh, $40 million of, of private investment and uh, shy, just shy of $20 million of catalytic capital, uh, deploying those dollars through a mix of these, um, these grants uh, and different investment products um, to leverage an additional $100 million into the region. Um, thus far, I has secured uh, right around $20 million into the IA fund, that's a private investment, and um, just shy of $3 million into our catalytic capital pool. Um, and the catalytic capital pool is an evergreen, um, evergreen fundraising fund. So I'm out there writing the grants. Um, so I feel the pain of all the folks on this call. <laughs> um, but um, our, our role as an intermediary is to get money to the ground. Um, and uh, how we do that is um, um, really my favorite part of, of this work. And, and I think sets I um, apart as a model um, and a partner. Um, again, um, here's just some more informational uh, information about our model, uh, our, our fund managers, our locus impact investing based in Virginia. And here are some of our core partners across the region, including CAN. Um, our board and staff are all regionally located. Um, me, names, and folks that you all know here. Um, and here's just some more information about the fund. Um, so there are some minimum fund commitments and size. It's, uh, you know, our, our technical assistance grants run uh, are around smaller ranges, around $50,000, but uh, we are really looking to invest into um, some um, medium, uh, small to medium sized projects across the region. Um, and uh, just some additional information about, you know, how the investment funds are working. Sorry, this is a new deck, so it's a bit wonky since I <laughs> downloaded it. Um, but our, our investment fund partners uh, range from uh, national insurance companies, banks, family foundations, national foundations, et cetera. Um, they're in many cases pulling funds out of their endowments, pulling funds out of uh, Wall Street and putting them into our fund so we can invest them into Main Street, um, which is what we need more of across this country. Um, and here's the bulk of my work. Um, the fund side of the house, we have two sides of the house. There's the fund and then there's the catalytic capital. Um, and this is, my, uh, this is my portion of the work. Um, so this uh, catalytic capital pool is used to build an inclusive and equitable pipeline of projects across the region, specifically working to ensure that we're centering equity and justice in our work, identifying um, and addressing systemic barriers and investing in underserved entrepreneurs. Um, and this is done in, in community, uh, in alignment with community needs and uh, primarily uh, centering transparency and accountability. Um, and this is done uh, by, um, through our community advisory council, which is a built-in um, community accountability mechanism within IA's organizational structure. Um, this is a group of primarily practitioners from across the region, uh, uh, rooted in and based in uh, rural communities. And the CAC um, acts as a self-governing body with NIA that shapes our catalytic capital investment priorities. Um, across sectors and, um, and within specific sectors. Um, they assist in the development of our pipeline of projects for investment and refining um, how we're measuring impact. Um, so these are, this is how we are putting uh, practitioners and the drivers in the driving seat to ensure that um, as we move through this work, as we're deploying uh, investment dollars into the region, that there is a constant positive feedback loop between practitioners on the ground and um, where the money is going. Um, so if anyone wants to nerd out on participatory design and self-governance at any point in time, please give me a shout. I'm always down to talk about that. <laughs> 
Um, but uh, more on the catalytic capital itself. Uh, we use these dollars to uh, address um, uh, risk analysis, really. So in a, tradi in a traditional banking and lending, um, a lot of rurality is often associated with risk in a lot of those calculations. So we use these grant dollars um, to provide entrepreneurs or projects that may not have the credit or liquidity to take investment out of a bank or even a CDFI um, to infuse um, capital into their projects so that they can leverage more investment. Um, we provide pre predominantly repayable, recoverable grants. Um, but uh, in doing that, um, these function in many cases as 0% loans that are patient and non-extractive um, um, so that we can layer, uh, we can absorb risk in the overall capital stack of a project. So starting with our catalytic capital, then our investment dollars can, uh, will assume oftentimes a subordinate position in a capital stack meaning that if the project or business takes a hit, our dollars take that first um, so that other investors have the confidence to come in uh, into a project on top of that. Um, thus far, uh, we have secured, again, just shy of $3 million in catalytic capital uh, from predominantly, I believe it's 90% of philanthropic partners from outside of the region um, to date. Uh, we have in, uh, deployed investment to 16 projects across the region, um, which is a committed $1.6 million. 100% of those projects are rural, 44% um, serving women-led projects, um, a quarter to BIPOC and minority-led projects, um, and 69% uh, of those grants are recoverable. So when they come back to us, after the determined time frame, uh, we can redeploy those grant dollars to support another project. Um, and in, uh, in doing so, as we're building out our pipeline um, and in working with the Community Advisory Council, we're laser focused on ensuring that we're um, building out a pipeline that centers uh, uh, equity and justice, um, um, identifying, um, uh, specific projects that are queer-led, women-led, Black-owned projects in the region to ensure that um, um, that uh, our communities are growing in an equitable, um, equitable power-building fashion. Um, and again, here's just some uh, additional uh, information about IA's goals and framework. Um, I'm happy to share these slides with you all after. Um, and I just want to last point on this is as we are uh, working with the Community Advisory Council um, to build out um, our pipeline investment priorities um, and impact measurement, uh, we want to ensure that we're doing this collaborative, co collaboratively and in a way that supports the region, whether that's from reducing rep grant reporting demands, because uh, we know that all of our folks are busy. We don't have time to be writing a grant report. Um, we want to ensure that that is a, a low touch and collaborative um, mixing uh, um, practices um, from that mixing um, impact reporting practices with strategic communications to develop multimedia um, uh, products uh, for public relations, social media, et cetera, um, and uh, as well as um, uh, ensure that we are um, collecting data that reflects systems level change across the region. Um, so I've said too much and I have to hop off early, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to take those now or circle back at any point. I think let's do questions after each of our panelists this session, Balon. Um, so that's a lot of information to digest. And I just want everyone to know all of this information is available and will be archived. And all of these sessions are recorded. Um, so people will be able to go back and look at them or share them maybe with other uh, partners or colleagues that they have. 
So Balin, can you talk a little bit about um, who who is on uh, the horizon in terms of food system work? In terms of projects that right. we're working with? Well, thus far we have, um, we've supported a number of uh, food systems projects that both directly and more at an, um, at a sort of uh, macro level. Um, we've deployed grant supporting uh, Snowville Creamery in Southeast Ohio. Thanks, Leslie. Um, uh, uh, Nick Wasi, the Nick Wasi Initiative in um, Western North Carolina is a, collaborating with the Eastern Band of Cherokee to develop a cultural center that will center uh, traditional foodways practices um, and support the local food systems in uh, Franklin, uh, North Carolina. So we're excited to be partnering on that, um, working collaboratively with the Foundation for Appalachian Kentucky, um, um, AIF, uh, the Appalachian Impact Fund, and Mountain Association to support um, fl long-term flood recovery, uh, specifically our um, uh, local family farms. Um, thanks again to Jennifer for um, her amazing leadership in that work. Um, and most recently, we just made a grant to um, New Roots Community Farm in Fayetteville, West Virginia. Um, to help support um, the development of their um, their rural grocer, their farm store, um, so that they have the equipment that they need to run their farm store uh, for this coming season. Um, so um, always excited to learn about new projects uh, happening across the region. Um, but as we move forward into the rest of this year and next, uh, I'm really interested in how I can support food aggregation, processing, and distribution projects, um, potentially um, also uh, including meat processing facilities, um, whether that be through real estate equipment or uh, facilities, including um, the installation of solar on some of these uh, projects. Um, but um, again, uh, my job is to take my cues from practitioners and community. Uh, so I'd love to um, uh, listen uh, and learn from all the work that y'all are doing. Great, thank you so much, Balin. We really appreciate the work that you and Andrew have accomplished thus far. And um, you know me, I'll keep bringing your projects. I'm sure many of the other Bring them on. organizations <laughs> will. <laughs> I always have ideas, you know. Any other questions for Balin? And then we need to let him disappear. Okay, don't see anything. Thank you, thank you. Um, so our next presenter uh, comes from a slightly different frame. And that is Cheryl with the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation of Nelsonville. I have uh, known Cheryl for a while. Uh, she's worn many hats. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe she'll share some of that in her introduction. Um, I'll let her talk about uh, the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation of Nelsonville a relationship also with a lot of the partners here in Appalachia, Ohio. So Cheryl, I did make you a co-host. Um, I'm not sure if you want to share slides. Um, I do great. have some and hopefully it just worked. Yep, it's working. Oh, fabulous. You know, you would think after all these time, these years, I'd have it down, but still working on the Zoom slides. So um, thanks, Leslie. Well, first and foremost, Balin, that was amazing. Um, like, I really don't want to follow you at this point, um, but um, I'm going to anyways. And as Leslie sh shared, I've had I've worn a few different hats. And one of my most recent hats is uh, prior to coming to the foundation is that I was a local food system strategies coordinator for the city of Columbus and, and housed at Columbus Public Health. So I have worked over the years with so many of the partners that you just described 
um, in, in that effort of, of trying to find creative ways to find capital um, for those businesses. So um, I applaud you in the work that you're doing and thank you for that. So um, I joined the foundation though about a year and a half ago um, to be on the side of looking at how do we move resources into that. And of course the foundation um, is a little bit different in that our, our primary business is making grants and, and predominantly working with those that are nonprofit organizations. So I'm going to take a few minutes today to share with you just a little bit about the foundations, a little background on, and who we are and what we do, um, and then share a little bit of work about our work on healthy food access and how we approach that, um, and then um, take a few minutes to share an example of that in action in Southeast Ohio, um, which Leslie's been obviously such a partner in. So um, thank you for the opportunity to be here with all of you today. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, and hopefully I can move my slides, there we go. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the Osteopathic Heritage Foundations, um, the um, we originated as the Doctors Hospital Foundation, which owned and operated Doctors Hospital Health System, including that included two hospitals in Columbus, Ohio, as well as Doctors Hospital in Nelsonville, Ohio. Um, founded in 1940, these two, this hospital system grew into um, an extremely high quality health system and one of the largest, most successful um, osteopathic physician training programs in the U.S. Uh, about 25 years ago, we're just coming up on our 25th anniversary, the assets of Doctors Hospital were sold to the Ohio Health System. And that presented a significant influx of funds into the foundation and formed the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation and the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation of Nelsonville. And that is the funding that supports our grant making to today. Um, we are two, um, actually two private nonprofit foundations um, that includes the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation and the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation of Nelsonville. And we have a shared mission to improve the health and quality of life in the community through education, research, and service consistent with our osteopathic heritage. So our grant making is aligned with osteopathic medicine. And, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with osteopathic medicine versus allopathic medicine. But as you look for a care provider in your community, you usually have the option of either a doctor who has a DO after their name or an MD after their name. Um, and DO is what we would refer to as an osteopathically trained physician. And their, their medical training um, looks just like um, an MD, but the osteopathic profession tends to have more of a holistic um, whole person approach to their training. They're trained in additional um, manipulative therapies that are um, uh, effective in treatment. Um, but this holistic approach is really a huge piece of what guides our funding. And so the um, osteopathic physicians and the, the profession considers the uh, interaction between body and mind. And it really, in our case, we apply that to recognize that health in, of communities is influenced by things like access to clinical care, but also social and economic factors in the physical environment. So as you see on our screen, on the screen, um, our funding priority areas um, to support this work are behavioral health and substance use disorders, collaborative funding partnerships, community responsive grants and support, osteopathic medical research and osteopathic medical education and healthy food access. Um, we have, with the two foundations, we have the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation that funds predominantly in central Ohio, main, mainly in Franklin County. And this is also the foundation that supports osteopathic medical education and research both in Ohio and nationally. In Southeast Ohio, we have the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation of Nelsonville, and that um, foundation funds predominantly behavioral health and substance use disorders, healthy food access, and then we work a lot in funding collaborations and partnerships. Um, and so this is the foundation where we provide support for AAFN or Appalachian, Accept Appalachian Accessible Food Network, which is really the project that if you give me a couple more minutes, I'm going to tell you all about. So, um, so as a foundation, and this is something that you'll see with a lot of foundations as you approach them, they have funding priority areas or things that they work on um, to try and take a deeper investment into a community and make a bigger difference. And for us, one of those things is healthy food access. And in our strategic investment here, we really um, recognize that there are two things that we have to look at when it comes to food system food system investing. 
We understand that the, the prevalence of both food insecurity and the lack of access to healthy food are perfect storm. This, is, this contributes to people not having enough food in the community and there's no one fix to it. And we know that if we can, we can improve health if fewer people experience hunger and more people have access to food. So we've really adopted what we call a dual strategy in our investments here. And we recognize the need to support the emergency food system, particularly innovation and investing there um, to really meet people's immediate needs. You know, we, we've got to make sure that people who need food have food. But we recognize that that requires additional investing in the system in the root causes. So we need to look at things like um, moving upstream and how do we support things like um, some of the products you've heard about today that are also um, driving economic um, uh, development and those types of things. So just to give you an example, in Southeast Ohio, one of the, the projects that we support in the emergency food system is something called Bounty on the Bricks, which provides financial support for pantries across the region to meet that critical need of people experiencing food security. And we're very excited to hear also, as Leslie shared, that um, Southeast Ohio um, Food Bank and many of their partners are starting to invest in purchasing more local food um, and starting to tighten up that collaboration in that space as well. But we also recognize that we need to work on investments in the upstream root causes of food insecurity there. And that brings us to the Appalachian Accessible Food Network and our investments in that space. So Appalachian, um, Appalachian Accessible Food Network, and I'm going to just call AAFN because I can't get Appalachian and Accessible out um, multiple times. It's kind of a tongue twister. Um, but this is a partnership that we have been supporting since 2013. Um, it's located again in our Southeast area, Ohio focus area, and the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation of Nelsonville has um, approved more than a million dollars in funding for this um, collaboration since 2013. Um, the first funding was approved to develop a strategic planning process, and this really was supporting three organizations who were already making extremely important um, contributions to the, the region, um, but recognized, um, we both recognized and they recognized that they could be more impactful if they were working together. So the three partners that came together in this initial planning um, were ACENET um, and the, the uh, fabulous Leslie Schaller. Um, and we, as you know, they work to create a dynamic, sustainable regional economy with opportunities for all. They manage the Food Venture Center in Athens, the Food and Farm Enterprise Center in Nelsonville. Um, and they took the lead in the, a, the AAFN coordination, um, including the fiscal sponsorship and employing a network coordinator to support the, the partnership. Community Food Initiatives is another partner, um, and they really focus on coordinating food access and nutrition information through farmers markets, pop-up sites, school and community gardens, and they also manage the Southeast Ohio Food Link mapping tool. Um, they, per, they coordinate food and seed giveaway programs, um, information booth at farmers market, and they help consumers in the area um, access food safety net programs um, where they can get food at low and no cost. And then Rural Action is the third partner who is building a more just economy by developing the region's assets um, in environmentally, socially, and economically sustainable ways. And their sustainable agriculture program, which operates the Chester Hill Produce Auction and connects local producers with buyers through um, institutional programs like Farm to School, and then consumers with their direct buying clubs uh, as well. So this initial funding supported the development of a seven-year plan that this group launched in 2014. Their focus was on enhancing, expanding, and sustaining regional healthy food access programs. And they formalized the collaboration, adopting the name Appalachian Accessible Food Network. Um, so we have, as you'll see here, there have been, we're now in phase four. We have the strategic planning phase, um, and we are now in phase four. And so over this time, they have built each year and each phase, excuse me, um, at, over the last 10 years and have really had a significant impact on affordability and access. The key developments that we um, kind of champion or uh, hang our hat on as a result of this funding, but of course, we all know these, these folks have done even more in the community. Um, but the things that we feel like our funding has really helped to support and advance um, are the, the donation stations where customers and vendors at the Athens Farmers Market and Chester Hill Produce Auction, as well as gardens, um, contribute produce 
for distribution through the pantries in the seven county region. I had the opportunity to go down last summer and get a chance to see some of the spaces and, and experience the Chester Hill Produce Auction for the first time. It's really a cool thing to see. I'm sure all of you do these things on a daily basis, but as a funder, it's really exciting to see that food move from the hands of the producer directly to the people who need it, as well as the buyers. So, so really, um, those are things that are exciting for us to see. We also have um, had some of our funding help support the country fresh shops and veggie vans. This, these are seasonal markets. The fresh shops are um, offering a variety of local produce um, at pharmacies, convenience stores, and medical facilities. And then the veggie van actually delivers in other areas as well, all across the six county area. And of course, these programs are well known for their farm to school innovations, um, moving pro produce from local farms to kids' plates um, and the purchasing that goes on there. And then of course, they're, they've got the capacity and have worked on building the capacity for freezing produce out of season, uh, for use out of season. Um, it's also helped to develop the Southeast Ohio Food Link, which is an online tool that connects people with food resources in the region and providing maps and contact information and details for food access sites. And then, of course, the training and business development that has been offered, um, helping people with employment and entrepreneurship, supply chain um, and healthy foods like the farm incubator at C uh, Chester Hill Produce Auction, safe food handling, all of those things. So again, from our perspective, we can see this continuum of, you know, from the, from the very ground up of donation stations and getting food to people who need it to really changing the economic trajectory of people in the region with the training and business development programs are really some of the highlights that we look at when we describe the, the success. So as we just reached, launched into phase four this last year, um, we um, uh, have, um, I should say, I should say the AAFN folks, not we, but um, the, the, as one of my colleagues used to say, the royal we, um, I'm not doing the work, I'm just collaborating to make sure that um, they get the resources they need. Um, but they're really looking to further coordinate their stakeholders and get their service providers and really keep strengthening that supply chain to increase access to local healthy food. Um, as always, increasing the volume of locally grown food and um, uh, the demand as well. Um, so, and then of course, providing access to the local food infrastructure so that processing and distribution continue to grow. Um, and of course, this, this um, time around, there's some real focus on strengthening partnerships with healthcare providers in, in the region for developing the produce prescriptions or what we kind of often refer to as the food as medicine strategies. Um, and then um, the offering the food industry training. So we continue to see that work. But I think what's really important to share is why is this, why is it on our side of things, and I'll let Leslie share in a minute on their side, but why do we feel like this is a successful partnership and why have we committed over the years to continuing to support it? Um, and what we've really seen is that it's there's been this committed group of partners who are dedicated to leveraging each other's strengths and sharing resources for the good of the local food system. So that they're benefiting the producers, the consumers, and really, everybody, all of the partners across the food system sector. So as we looked at, at the projects and have continued to see this, it's been really one of the most successful projects I've observed where partners have come together and said, we're going to put all of our resources together and move things along. Um, of course, the other reason it's very successful is we have a very effective fiscal sponsor in ACENET. Um, their, their management, their reporting is top notch. Um, and so they have, have done a great job of keeping us surprised. And so that I can sit here 10 years later and have even just joining the, the, um, the, organ, the foundation a year and a half ago, and I can tell you what's been accomplished. Um, and that's really been thank, thanks to the work that they do. Um, I think one of the other things that made this really Im is effective is there was, they developed a coordinated long-term plan and they implemented the plan with committed staff support. So, um, you know, oftentimes when we look at um, this work, um, we have a tendency to see, um, and we try as funders not to drive this, but what we call mission creep is we're trying to figure out how to get the next pot of funding and we adjust our, our mission or our work to, to meet those needs of, or demands of what they're looking for. So for us to really be able to see that long-term plan and, and each of the organizations kind of staying true to their mission and driving this work together, um, that's been a really, really effective um, tool from our perspective. Then I think the multi-year funding um, that we've been able to provide has been important. And I think Leslie will tell you, it wasn't multi-year right at the very beginning. It was 
we funded a planning process and we once we saw the planning process and was successful, then we were able to commit a little bit more um, long term funding, um, which my understanding from Leslie and the partners is that this lets them use a match or use this dollars as a match, helps them leverage and get other money, and it helps them plan a few years out so that they can build their stronger programs, they can build out projects and know that there's some funding and, and support for it as they go through. Um, and I think one of the things that strikes me is that they've had some very measurable outcomes, but more importantly, they've measured them. Um, they've developed a tracking system of more than 50 outcomes and outputs to demonstrate these results. And, and again, um, you know, I don't think everybody needs 50, which, but Leslie's got it. Um, so, but it's, it's a matter of being clearly able to demonstrate to us this is what the funding was used to do, and this is the outcome that was achieved because of it. So as a, as a funder, you always want to know that the dollars that you invested into this the space made a difference in the community. And I think that's something that AAFN has been extremely good at doing is helping to demonstrate that. So we're excited. I'm excited as I got to just join Leslie on this journey here in the last year. And I'm really excited to see the success of their work this next phase um, and continuing to celebrate their success. So um, I appreciate the chance to share it with you. And I'm happy to take any questions about funding if I can help you. Well, I think I'm too bashful to say anything at this point. Um, <laughs> I did put in the chat, though. I think one of the strengths of being within networks, whether it's CAN, whether it's in the Appalachian Accessible Food Network, is that we can hold each other accountable mm -hmm. and do better design work. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, I am a data nerd um, because, I mean, I don't want to drink my own Kool-Aid. I want to know if we're really making a, a difference or not. Um, and Mary Beth, you might have, Mary Beth is our executive director from CFI. I'm sure she has more to um, add here as well. Yeah, not much. I mean, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Cheryl and to Leslie for um, offering this session. And thank you to Cheryl for all of the kind words and really thoughtful observations. I think a question I'm curious about in this dynamic of having funders and, and implementers working together and partnering and having long term conversations, you know, from your view, which is different, you know, than ours, because you have sort of mm -hmm. a different scope and different perspective, you know, what are the things that you're most um, optimistic or excited or kind of fired up about in terms of this shifting work toward a real fair food system? I mean, what do you see as the future? of this work from your perspective as a funder? Sure. Well, you know, I mean, in all honesty, at the end of the day, um, you know, what our board asks of us is do our, our do more people have access to food? Do more people um, have less, need to have less reliance on the emergency food system? You know, we're making a dual investment, but the ultimate goal is to really move to the place where people have fair and equitable access to food, the food they want, the food they choose, those types of things, and that it supports the local economy in every single step. So for me, you know, and I'm and I'm taking off my foundation hat a little bit and, and putting on my Cheryl Graffinino, who really loves this space, um, but, I, but I still speak on behalf of the foundation. I think for us, it's really this, this shift in, um, the shift in trying to stem the tide of, um, people having to rely on less healthy food, food that's processed and travels thousands of miles that doesn't ultimately contribute to their health and well-being. Um, and that they're moving into a space where they're able to select foods that are closer to them and those types of things. And if we look at this, the way I always like to describe it when we talk about the osteopathic principles and practices, you know, our physicians who are practicing in Southeast Ohio one of the struggles they have is making sure their patients are eating healthy, that they're getting more fresh fruits and vegetables, that they're able to help manage their blood pressure with a minimum of medication. And so really being able to start to see that connection between, you know, when our when our physicians that we, you know, we support significantly at a, a HCOM, the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine at OU, when those graduates go out and practice, our goal is that we've changed the communities that their patients live in and that 
they're able to be healthier and follow through on their recommendations. I might have gone into a couple rabbit holes there, but um, bottom line, we, we're we really excited about the idea of shifting where people get food um, and their 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 um, ability to choose for themselves. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. It's, I mean, it's been an incre uh, incredible partnership. And again, to our friends at USDA, it's this investment from local philanthropy that provides us with the match. My staff always make fun of me because I use the word match um, probably a hundred times a day. Um, but we wouldn't be able to leverage a lot of the other uh, investments uh, without uh, local philanthropy at our side. So thanks so much. So now we're gonna segue to the uh, other incredible partnerships um, for creating solutions for our local food systems. And that's CDFIs. Uh, we have Martin Jenkins, the executive director. I still have trouble saying their new name, Partner Community Capital. I still wanna go back to NCIF. Uh, Martin and I um, have been on this journey for a really long time since he was a young person and I was maybe a little less of a young person. Um, so I totally appreciate his uh, uh, attendance here to present today. So thanks, Martin. And I did make you a co-host in case you have slides. Well, thank you and welcome. You're gonna have to give me some, This it's hard to believe. This is my first PowerPoint that I've had to do. Oh my goodness. During COVID. That's, that's the benefits from being here as long as I have. <laughs> like I've known been working with you and can for over central Appalachian network for over 20 years is that I don't have to navigate. So I'm going to, I think there we go. Um, and I you am, need some technical assistance. I, 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 I think I'm here now. You got it. It looks like great uh from the beginning come on there we go so good morning everyone and thank you um as i'm martin jenkins with partner community capital formerly known as natural capital investment fund um you know the name change and the rebranding is probably a 30-minute presentation in itself but we don't have the time and um, I'm here to provide an overview of our work in the local food space. And I am joined by Liberty Newberry, who is our manager, manager of our value chain cluster initiative, which really is the heart and soul of our local food related technical assistance work here in um, West Virginia. And so if there are questions related to that, after it, you know, at the end, I'm gonna kind of defer to, to Liberty. Otherwise, I'll just get it wrong, and she'll be cor correcting me in the comments section. So, <laughs> um, I just so partner community capital, formerly known as NCIF, is you know we are a Treasury certified community development financial institution or CDFI, which means that we are we are a mission based um, small business lender with a primary focus on um, serving, you know, low and moderate income, uh, small businesses in, in low and moderate income communities acro in, across our target market. Um, but our mission is to catalyze environmentally sustainable uh, development by providing affordable, flexible capital and advisory services to small and emerging um, businesses. And we use the word businesses. It's we, it means everything from farm to, to kind of rural healthcare providers and everybody in between that create employment in underserved communities. Um, we were founded by uh, the Conservation Fund in 2001. Conservation Fund is a national nonprofit environmental organization with a commitment to supporting working landscapes. Um, and so when we launched, we started with a focus around ecotourism, value added agriculture and forest products in 38 ARC distressed and at risk community counties here in, in West Virginia. And over the past 20 years, we have expanded the cover parts of eight central Appalachian states um, and southeastern states with a continued focus on um, rural and here we go. And uh, the triple bottom line uh, kind of framework. We are 
current so we from a from a, for, for folks who are not from West Virginia, we we really focus on the ARC designated counties in in Maryland, Appalachian, you know, Ohio, Kentucky, um, down into to Tennessee. Uh, we work all across North, uh, North Carolina and cover parts of uh, Virginia from Shenandoah Valley and sort of south down through the kind of the southwest. Um, we are partner community capital is okay um, give me a second here is we are primarily a small business lender um, we work across a broad range of, of sectors and as we talk you know, from from local food to daycare and and healthcare, we take a holistic approach to um our, our lending, it's really really trying to meet 100% of the needs in, in, a, in a community um, and our, our loans. And for, for that reason, you know, we'll make loans everywhere from uh, $5,000. And I apologize for the, uh, uh, the kind of mistake here, up to, up to a million and a half. And um, we really try and meet the, uh, our, our borrowers where, where they're, where they where, with a with a right package based on on in their needs and um in the eligible uses in addition to the kind of traditional real estate which would be farm expansions farm acquisitions to uh working capital for for uh and fixed that equipment financing you know we also have been asked in the, in the ag space to help with kind of bridge financing for for cost share grants whether it's for uh, you know hoop houses or you know USDA uh, uh, reap grants mm -hmm. for for solar energy efficiency, um, so we've done a we do a lot we've done a lot historically over the years in in that space, and then you know we work from startups to expansions to ownership transition, and our our goal is to try to be flexible to make sure we get the best package. And over the years, we've also partnered with um, specialty programs for new and beginning farmers, and we provide gap financing because you know they're you know they they've been approved by USDA, but funding may not be available until Congress approves their budget, so we can step in and provide that kind of kind of bridge financing. And in Ohio, we we partnered. And helped one. I want to say it was one of Rural Action's clients years ago on some bridge financing. I think we were in there for two years while they were waiting for Congress to to kind of approve and disperse the funds. And Leslie, I can't remember the name of that farm, but they were doing. Uh, it was actually you know it was a new generation stepping up to to kind of grow their farm, and they were in strawberry production. But um, we we tried to be flexible and uh, we leverage our network of kind of bank and non-bank partners to kind of put the right financing kind of package together. And um, what I think what makes us successful at, in this space is that we recognize that, you know, ag lending is um, very different. So we have, we have set up a board that uh, has ag lending experts on it. So when we're, we're, we're reviewing ag loans and thinking about structuring, we make sure we have the right, right expertise to, um, to kind of to, to provide that assistance. And um, we, hey, Leslie, can you pop the slides up that I gave you? We're having some issues here. I'm gonna have to back up. Okay, I don't know. Um, I don't. I think we just see two at a time, Martin. That might okay. be okay. Well, like, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop crazy. on that, but uh, <laughs> but we'll, we're gonna give up on the slides there because it's not something's not quite right on my end. But I, I really on on to you know we have been committed to supporting local food value added ag enterprises really from from day one. It has been you know. It's our belief as a CDFI, it's a way to create wealth in communities, to kind of create jobs, and is is our heritage of, uh, of an environmental nonprofit. You know, it, I think it's critical to kind of support working landscapes and um, 
the, the communities that t- depend on those. And over the years, we have worked, we talk about working along the value chain from farm to fork. We have worked literally from, from farm to fork and every, everywhere in between. Um, we've been able to work with, whether it's, you know, and to the, the, to the, to the intermediaries that are critical to that supply chain, whether it's large animal vets, you know, um, aggregators and distributors of produce to slaughter facilities to the butcher shops, co-op grocery stores and restaurants or farmers markets that are, are um, supporting local, you know, you know, buying local from from their local, their farming communities, mm-hmm. um, and for. For those from from West Virginia, I mean, we have some great if familiar with like Swift Level Fine Meats. It's a butcher shop that buys from over 75 farmers in um, the Greenbrier Valley. But that loan started with a loan to a to a grass fed beef operator, and then they went and they said, "Hey, we need to develop a market." And then we helped them kind of with equipment and working capital financing to la- to launch a butcher sh- butcher shop, and they. Uh, a farmer's a retail outlet to, to kind of sell um, local foods. But we have done in um, Summersville, West Virginia, we had helped with herd expansion to uh, Motesville, Virginia, Motesville, West Virginia, where we helped the Sickler family farm with a, a, a you know, bridge financing to, to purchase a wood fired heating system for, for their greenhouse operation. To, to North Carolina, where we helped a traditional row crop farmer launch a uh, organic dairy operation, um, simply, in, a simply natural farm in, in Aden, North Carolina. And what's interesting about that project was they went from dairy to value added, you know, to a creamery, and they were selling you know, milk and ice cream and, and cheese. And to an to an ag, you know, agritourism opportunity where they had hundreds of thousands of people a year visiting their their farm, um, to I think one of our fastest growing kind of segments of our our loan portfolio is uh, the the brewery and and cidery space where in, in West Virginia we've we've helped numerous um, breweries and and uh, cidery Hawknob cidery in Southern West Virginia kind of launch with a focus on trying to buy and incorporate local local products in case of the cidery. They were reviving uh, heirloom apple um, orchards in, in in their market. And it was exciting because they were a bunch of young ag at, um, graduates out of WVU who said, we're, we're going to start this. And they, they did it from scratch, worked on the policy piece to kind of get cideries approved at the state level to kind of launching now very successful cidery. But we also recognize aggregation and distribution is infrastructure is a critical piece. And over the years, we've worked with groups like Eastern Carolina um, Organics and North Carolina, which aggregate and distribute produce to um, Mother Earth um, Produce in Asheville, which was a slightly different aggregation distribution model where they partnered with farmers and then delivered um, direct to uh, consumers in, in Western North Carolina. And during COVID, they expanded that and leveraged their infrastructure to support other local food producers from, from bakeries and, and, and meat producers to kind of get product to consumers from you know, sort of Western North Carolina down into Charlotte and into kind of parts of South Carolina. Um, and you know, one of my favorite product projects was firsthand food in, in Durham, North Carolina, where it's an aggregation distribution network for, for meat products, and um, which was exciting because you know they they had a very complicated supply chain going back to, to kind of slaughter facilities to the end, you know, the producers, the farm, and it's given us an opportunity to think about how we support and provide. Kind of technical assistance and financing to support every one of those pieces of, of that of that chain. And um, another sector where we've seen growth is you know the creamery space. And, and an example would be Firefly Creamery in Accident, Maryland, where in addition to helping them go through a USDA 
uh, REAP grant, which is a rural electrification for America program. We helped them put solar on their, on their building there in Accident, Maryland, but also provided working capital to help them kind of expand their, um, their, their production capacity. Um, although, you know, I've kind of learned over the years that, you know, the capital piece is critical, but which I think is more important is that the technical assistance um, services that wrap around and that really make up the, the kind of the vast, I guess, com vast component, the largest component of our kind of community network that we rely on. People like um, Leslie, I remember bringing her to, to West Virginia almost 20 years ago to help a value-added meat producer with a, um, a request to do a third-party audit. But, you know, we provide technical assistance services, and they're funded in part by you know, groups like Appalachian Regional Commission, USDA, and our bank partners through our Women's Business Center, our staff, and, and third-party consultants. Um, and in the case of local food, we developed the Value Chain Cluster Initiative, which really, you know, over five years ago, to really focus on providing targeted assistance to agriculture from, from the farm up to the uh, intermediaries. More recently, the work is focused on building capacity of um, kind of those aggregation distribution intermediaries or kind of the pad piece. But this assistance ranges from accounting to marketing to engineering or help with cost share grants. But um, yeah, my, my lesson learned has been this piece is, is absolutely critical and in many cases more important than, than the loan capital and um, is really our first step for engaging and working with local food um, enterprises is across the region. Um, right now, our the bulk of our technical assistance services are limited to our West Virginia and North Carolina market. But as we go through a kind of a kind of a reassessment strategic planning process for our, our local food work, you know, one of the things we're we're trying to think through is how to how do we scale it so we can provide more of those services in our in our other other markets. Um, but that that's sort of a, a work in, in progress for us. Um, and one, one last piece that we have going on is we've, we've launched a statewide tourism initiative here in West Virginia in partnership with the Department of Tourism um, and Woodlands Community Lenders and other CDFI based in Elkins, West Virginia. And the real focus of, of that work is on helping tourism and nonprofit, you know, you know, small businesses and, and nonprofits kind of related to outdoor recreation, but um, in downtown redevelopment. But, you know, we've always taken the approach that local food enterprises are kind of critical to the success of kind of Main Street and, and downtown redevelopment strategies. So we see, you know, continuing to support local food um, enterprises, part of this new initiative is is core to that and what's exciting for us is that these are it's a flexible pot of funding that's supporting this work it allows us to work in all 55 counties in in, in west virginia um, that program kind of rolled out really at the end of kind of q4 last year and we're now just starting to go on the road with um with with that program but um we'll be working across across the state on that and we're, we're we're now seeing projects, you know, all across West Virginia related to, to kind of local food related um, from from restaurants to um, was pipeline to uh, to to some some uh, expansions of cideries and and kind of breweries focused on incorporating local food. But well, I'm going to rudely gonna interrupt there. you, Martin. Thank you. I wasn't. <laughs> Thank you. But I, but I think the one shout out I want to do um, is definitely, I think, what's been exceptional in terms of your CDFI, and you highlighted it a little bit, it's the whole farm to fork um, value chain investments that you've been able to make. And I think we've been adding to the chat, you know, some of the investments that you've made 
uh, in Ohio, but uh, it's really been a game changer throughout the region. And I think, you know, Liberty has joined us in the past to talk about the technical assistance role that VC2 uh, shoulders as well. So it's just phenomenal resources. We thank you. Um, I'm going to try and keep us on track. Um, I would also recommend that people check out your website because you have a lot mm -hmm. of success stories there. Go ahead, Martin. The one I'll last worry. caveat caveat to farm to fork is we tell folks we're not competing with the traditional ag financing resources that are available to farmers. As you've complained in the past, we are not the super low cost source of loan capital, but we help people with the technical assistance offered by group or orgs like yourself to kind of get to there. And that I should have mentioned that early on. It's if you can qualify for additional ag financing, we just can't compete on on price on that. So we have to remind people of that. Yeah, thanks so much, Martin. And thanks Liberty too, for all the work that you do. Um, as partners within CAN and uh, throughout the region. I'm going to quickly pass the baton to Jennifer. Um, for those of us who have been on this journey, summit after summit, Jennifer is always our great moderator so that we get a little break before we do our last session, um, but also gives people an opportunity to provide some feedback. And I think we'll reconvene at 12.05. So Jennifer, go ahead. Okay. Well, and thank you, Leslie. Um, I want to extend a thank you to you um, for uh, providing some vision and a lot of cat herding for this whole series. Uh, I very much appreciate it. Um, so as with, as we have done in the past, we are going to do a little bit of an active break. There'll be an activity for you. Um, I'm going to put some music on and you can go refill your coffee cup, but make certain that you come back and we're going to go, we're going to do two things. I'm dropping two links into the chat. Um, one is a Google form with a two question survey on um, uh, what you think about the summit series so far, or I guess we have about an hour to go left in the summit series. <laughs> think of the summit series. Um, and then um, we're going to do uh, a word cloud, or we're going to do a, a kind of a word cloud um, based on what you commit to doing in, say, the next three months um, to build a fair future fair food system in your community. Um, think about what you have learned, um, ideas you've gotten from this series and um, what you can commit to actually making happen in your own community. So both of those links are now in the chat. Um, I'm going to share my screen in theory. Um, so we can see as, um, um, answers come in and I'm going to put some music on and uh, we'll see you back in nine minutes.
We have about two minutes before we come back. If you want to make certain that you get your uh, uh, idea, your task, your commitment up on the Menti board. We are about, well, actually, my clock just turned to 12.05, so I'm going to turn it back to Leslie um, to continue with our policy discussion. And Thank you. For, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> I will drop the link again into the chat for uh, both this commitment list as well as the two-question feedback survey. Well, thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, any reflections? Do, anything you wanted to point out, or we'll just uh, share them in the future? We'll share them in the future. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's the right answer. Yeah. Um, so thanks to everyone. I keep getting um, emails and chats from folks. Um, I know a four hour agenda. We'll never do this again in the future, folks. Um, so those of you who are holding on, um, and I think some folks will be coming back to join us. Now we're really going to talk about, you know, what are some of the regional and statewide conversations uh, happening around food and farm policy. And we have two presenters who thankfully are with us uh, here in this uh, noon to closing slot. Um, one of them is a longtime partner of ACENET and just um, a great colleague and friend of mine, Emily uh, Lipstroop from uh, uh, OFA. Um, Emily is going to start us off. And I think if I'm following all the correct chat information, it sounds like, Emily, I should um, pull up your slides for you. Does that sound right? Well, maybe we've lost her already. Oh dear. Okay, well, 
let me check my email again. Um, maybe Kimmy, maybe we'll we'll cue you up first then if you're if you're ready to go. Um, thank you. <laughs> I see you. Um, would you like to unmute? Welcome, welcome, welcome. And Kimmy and Martin, I think are gonna talk about some of the uh, policy impacts within uh, Kentucky. So Kimmy, I'll let you introduce yourself, please. Yeah. So hello, everybody. I am Kimmy Ishmael. I am with um, I'm with Community Farm Alliance out of uh, Berea, Kentucky, but I am in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. I am our policy campaign coordinator there, and I do all of our policy work at statewide policy as well as some federal policy. Martin, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> sure. Um, I'm probably a known commodity. I am Martin Richards. I'm the executive director of Community Farm Alliance, and I am coming to you from Berea, Kentucky. Okay. Kimmy, did you want me to do a little background first? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so some of this won't come to, as any news to you all, but um, you know, Community Farm Alliance has been operating Kentucky Double Dollars, um, which is for incentive program uh, to double up the food nutrition benefits that folks are using through WIC and senior farmers market, as well as SNAP. And we include in SNAP um, healthy proteins in that too. Um, so we've been doing this since, like, or, you know, I guess it's 2014, maybe when we first launched it, um, at six farmers markets in East Kentucky. Uh, that the program has grown over these years. Um, we encompass, you know, uh, Statewide now, um, I don't know what the exact count, to be honest with you, is for this year um, from the application. But nonetheless, it is something like 30 farmers markets or more. Um, we also uh, have a program at like 19 community markets, um, as well as five retailers. Um, so, you know, we rely on multiple sources of funding for this. Um, you know, besides private donations, um, you know, the Kentucky Ag Development Fund has supported uh, WIC seniors and meat, eggs, and SNAP meat, eggs, and dairy. Um, but by far, you know, SNAP fruits and vegetables is, is uh, a really big component of this. And we have been utilizing USDA NIF adjustment grants uh, for that. We are actually preparing our third adjustment grant. Um, but one of the big challenges, um, and this is, you know, definitely includes almost all of federal grants, um, but specifically those that support healthy food access is a match requirement. And um, Gut SNP in particular requires a 50% match. And that has been one of the big limiting factors, I think, um, you know, in how much we can expand this program is that match. Um, and so, you know, in, and when you apply to GUSNIP, it's in almost all USDA grants to ask for a sustainability. Right? Um, and, you know, so again, one of the challenges to this. So we, we've been um, presenting, you know, in, in front of the Kentucky legislature for a number of years. They, um, we give them an update on the program. We also, you know, identify the challenges to this. But coming up with that federal map, um, is hugely is a huge problem, and one of the ways that we have proposed to deal with this is to do what I think it's now 14 other states have done, is to create a state fund. Um, we call it, or it's now called the Healthy Farm and Food Innovation Fund, and again, that fund is um, will be set up to receive uh, state, federal, and private funds. That initially goes to help eight federal match requirements, um, not only for CFA programs, but you know any other um, programs that are utilizing federal funds for healthy food access. 
Um, yeah. One of the interesting things um, about this as we've had conversations with uh, state legislators is um, a couple of things. One is, you know, the Kentucky does not get enough federal um, senior benefits so that every farmer's market in the state can offer those. And the question has been asked, like, well, how much more would we need? And I think the answer is, I don't know, but we can find that out. And then the same question has been asked of the WIC infants and children um, farmers market uh, nutrition program in that not every farmers market in the state can, um, can offer those again because of federal funding. So I, I think the conversation has expanded over these last several years, you know, to include the, the potential for this fund to do more than just provide masses, but start meeting, filling in some of the gaps around food and nutritional security. Um, so, so that is that is kind of the background uh, of why this fund. <laughs> now I'm gonna turn it over to Kimmy, who's really been leading that advocacy effort in Frankfurt. Yeah, so I will have my contact info also at the end of this. So if anybody has any more follow-up questions or policy questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, so uh, Martin covered a lot of this, but we'll kind of touch on it a little bit more to clarify some of these things. Um, we'll talk about what is House Bill 384, why do we need it, what are the impacts, and how do we succeed at this, um, and then end with uh, how you all can engage uh, in this work as well. So um, House Bill 384, like Martin said, is... Um, the Healthy Farm and Food Innovation Fund. This would create a structured state fund capable of receiving state, federal, and private funds. This would help Kentucky address food and nutritional security and support local farmers. Um, like Martin said, you know, this would be used to house matching funds for federal grant programs, and those can look like, you know, Kentucky double dollars. Kimmy, I'm sorry, we're not seeing anything on yeah, your screen. Yeah, seems to be a glitch on the screen. Hmm, okay, we hold just on. have a loading uh, message. Okay, so I don't know if you want to try and share your screen again. We love technology. <laughs> okay. Okay, hold on one second. Can you all see this? Yes, yay. Yes, yes there it is. Can you see this? No. no. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is fine. I will just share. Oh, I have to exit the full screen. Yeah, apologies to everyone. People seem to be having some uh, hiccups with the Zoom link to here. Um, Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. So, um, yeah. So the House Bill 384 is the Healthy Farm and Food Innovation Fund. This would be used to house uh, matching funds for uh, different uh, federal grant programs. But this fund would actually specifically help programs that um, help farmers, local producers, seniors. WIC and children, um, as well as SNAP participants, but they also, these programs are required to use Kentucky grown products. So this would help, you know, um, different, uh, help farmers and different farms um, put money back into their pockets while expanding their business and customer base. These programs can look a lot like our seniors farmers market nutrition program, where you, where seniors can double their dollars at at local farmers markets, as well as the Fresh Rx for Moms program, which stands for Mothers to Be on Medicaid. And that program actually is a prescription program where the expectant mom can get $20 a week up to 40 weeks while she's pregnant on local fruits and vegetables. So these are the kind of programs this fund uh, would want to uh, help support with these uh, housing, these funds for these federal programs. So why do we need House Bill 384? Um, Martin touched a little bit on this, but um, starting with food insecurity and uh, the low numbers that Kentucky 
Um, well, the high numbers, you know, we have extremely high food insecurity in Kentucky, where um, 22% of Kentucky's children are food insecure. You know, one in six adults are food insecure. We have one of the highest rates of food insecurity in seniors. Um, and, you know, 17% um, or 1%, uh, one in six, like I said, that's higher than the national rate of 15%. So we know that people are hungry and they, and we know that people need food. And right now these programs are helping connect the uh, producers, the growers of that food with people who need it. But also we need to look at our nutritional health in Kentucky, which is also not great at all. Um, so Kentucky ranks in the bottom in health uh, statistics with about 66% of Kentuckians being overweight. Um, we only consume about two or more or three fruits and vegetables a day. Um, that's only about 4% when the U.S. average is 8%. Um, we uh, also 38% of Kentucky's children ages 10 to 17 are actually considered overweight or obese as well. So not only do we have a food insecurity problem, but we have a nutritional health problem as well. So then we look at what Martin said about these programs and how they're funded. So many of these great programs like Kentucky Double Dollars or Fresh Rx for Moms are uh, funded by federal grants. And um, a lot of these require match uh, matching dollars. Um, for many people, this is extremely hard and a very big challenge. Um, and that creates a lot of program instability and hindering the growth of these programs that are actually helping the people in our communities. So the Healthy Farm and Food Innovation Fund or House Bill 384 would allow them to leverage these funds uh, to use um, as match. And this would allow more time to be spent and focusing on these programs and securing a growing future for these programs. Um, but we, one of the big uh, standout things is we know that Kentuckians want to eat locally. Um, this map that I have here, uh, it shows that many Kentucky counties um, the local purchasing, uh, produce purchasing went up anywhere from 100 to 700 percent from 2013 to 2017. So we know people are wanting to eat local. We just need to get them the food and have the programs in place to do so. Um, but also SNAP participation at farmers markets from 2014 to 2020 went up 123%. And like Martin stated, we started Kentucky Double Dollars in 2014. So we know if people have access to these programs, they are going to absolutely choose local over um, the big box stores uh, when it comes down to it. So we need to figure out uh, with the House Bill 384, um, that it's important to invest in these in these programs and putting back into these communities. So, what are the impacts? What would come if this were to be implemented, and afterwards, what would that look like? So, it would increase funding for these programs. It would create stability. Um, and establish new opportunities for direct farm impact food access programs. So, you know, I, we talk a lot about Kentucky Double Dollars, but there's so many other great ideas out there that would be able to help our community as well. So a lot of room to expand and be innovative with, with this fund. Um, and we, we know that it's gonna impact our economy. We had, um, and these programs uh, were studied by a, uh, by the University of Kentucky, it showed that the return on investment for Kentucky Double Dollars was $8.45 to every $1. So we know that the impact is very great on our community uh, economy-wise, so um, we can only know how hopefully how that, their health outcomes uh, become. Um, of course, it would help farmers growing their business, families getting accessibility to, to these um, 
to these local produce uh, producers, but it would decrease their household income uh, insecurity, food insecurity, while also improving their health. But like I said, also improving our economy as well and keeping those dollars local. So how do we succeed? We need to build and organize grassroots efforts around feeding and farming issues, and then lift up those voices, those impacted voices like farmers, seniors, and other program participants, and then introduce and pass this House Bill 384 in the Kentucky General Assembly, which we've already had got introduced, but now we're looking to get it passed. So how can you get involved? Um, this is the best way to get involved. You can write an email if you are based in Kentucky to your representative um, or call your representative if you're in Kentucky. But if you are not in Kentucky but still want to show support, feel free to share on social media all of our posts. Um, follow us at just Community Farm Alliance on all social media platforms, as well as you can visit our website, which is just cfaky.org, and you can download all the graphics for House Bill 384 as well. So there's my contact info again, and if you need anything else, feel free to ask me questions. Well, let's pause here now, Kimmy, and maybe you can answer some questions and our friends at CFA as well, Martin and Jennifer. So how about questions? I mean, this seems like an amazing lift that you guys have put together here. Um, I mean, I sort of understand the motivations, but how long has this, um, you know, what, what's been the process, I guess? I kind of want to look behind the curtain as to all the hard work you've had to do to get this far. Well, I've been here for a few years and it started before me, so Martin can speak to that. <laughs> I don't know. I, well, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole. <clears throat> um, but, um, you know, this work really started, oh, I'd say about a decade ago, right? I mean, again, I was a tobacco farmer that then went into organic fruits and vegetables, right? Um, you know, the beauty of tobacco was there was a whole system set up um, that supported you know, tobacco production, you know, essentially provided, you know, baseline of support for that. Um, but when you talk, start talking about local food, <laughs> there's none of that, right, is, is in there. And so CFA did research and, you know, we looked at all the federal, there's like 14 federal food nutrition programs um, and how much money was coming into Kentucky. And we said, gee, if we could capture some of that money, um, and obviously SNAP is the biggest one, right? So if we could capture that money um, and, and use it as a baseline of support. So for instance, if you're a farmer's market, you know, year in and year out, you can say, yes, last year I did whatever, $20,000 in SNAP sales. Well, then you have a pretty good idea from one year to the next. So there's, you have that baseline of support. Um, and to accomplish that, you know, that's where a farmer's market support program comes in, you know, helping, helping the market to accept, um, you know, WIC and seniors and SNAP especially, um, and then having the double up program to help drive, uh, drive that market to all that. So again, really this work started as our attempt to, you know, provide some uh, economic stability to local and regional food systems. And then, of course, it, it's become so much more. And today, you know, it's all about food as medicine. Um, then I think that, you know, we have been, from a policy perspective, you know, we've had the mantra for years and years that local, local food systems are economic development. And we have seen that message be taken up um, among politicians. Um, the next part that you know, we have done is like, hey, healthy food access is also good economic development, not only from, as Kimmy said, uh, you know, in the multiplier effect of getting these federal funds to circulate, but then the next part is, you know, um, is, is about the, you know, I'll use like why, 
why the MCOs have supported this work, right? Because they have they have seen that it's more cost effective for them to invest on the up in the upfront in making healthy food accessible than on the back end through healthcare and prescriptions. So you know that's the other aspect of this economic development. And again, now you know, we're even seeing it finally. Um, as is typical, being brought up to the federal level and that recognition too um, for all of this. I feel like I went down a rabbit hole there, but did I answer your question? Yes, <laughs> hey, I was going to say, but uh, legislatively, we did not get introduced uh, in the House last year as in bill form. We tried to do a budget line item for the fund um, because it was a budget year, because every two years in Kentucky is a budget year. Um, so this year we uh, set up the fund and have it uh, as House Bill 384 and it got introduced. We uh, passed unanimously out of committee and we've gotten two readings on the floor so far um, and we have two legislative days left coming up. Um, all we needed was one reading to uh, before midnight on Thursday to to be able to pass, to have a chance of passing. So we got two readings. Um, and so that's a pretty good look, but you know, we're really hoping for the best, but um, not sure. But like Martin said, this has been over a decade of work and building relationships at the state house and, you know, really, really hitting the ground running um, and being on the ground with these uh, decision makers. You know, one of the interesting aspects, so, Kentucky has a Republican supermajority in the House and Senate. We do have a Democratic governor. Um, you know, and when it comes to the hunger issue, we're also fortunate that the current uh, Republican Commissioner of Agriculture has made that his like um, main issue. But for legislators, like, oh, people are hungry in Kentucky, that, that's too bad, right? Um, but when we start honing in on the economics of it, right, um, that how good a return on investment, you know, from public funds this is. And then the idea of like, oh, you know, we need this match because otherwise we're leaving federal funds on the table. And so it's that economic framing that has really, um, I think, gotten legislators on board uh, with this whole concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it does help that Kentucky's a top agricultural state, so you know, farmers are very important to, to lift up in the legislature. Yeah, and we're also part of a national kind of cohort of folks working on, on this, you know, particular kind of legislation. Um, and that's a, another, you know, reoccurring theme, especially across the South, is, you know, focusing on the economics of um, accessing, you know, affordable, healthy food. Um, that has been the driver uh, for a lot of this stuff. And, and I will say, you know, uh, that, you know, several years ago, we got um, a grant from uh, Voices for Healthy Kids uh, that allows us to do a lot of this work, uh, including some of the advocacy work um, for it. And that has been instrumental, uh, especially bringing on Kimmy. Well, just amazing, you guys. I mean, this is a really impressive body of work. And I think many of us throughout Central Appalachia can learn from what you're developing here and certainly good luck as you proceed. Um, you know, advocacy is challenging work at times because, um, you know, we, we want to navigate that razor's edge of what feels like advocacy and education and what feels like a, a more uh, catalytic uh, policy making at the legislative uh, space. So uh, again, thanks um, to CFA and to all the partners um, throughout Kentucky. Um, you guys, I think, have created a model that many of us can follow. Um, so I'm going to welcome our next speaker, uh, I started to do a little bit of an introduction um, for Emily here a, a minute or two ago. Um, thanks that we've navigated, I guess, hopefully all the Zoom technology issues. So we're delighted to have you, Emily. Um, just a little background. Um, again, you know, one of the perks of being one of the 
co-organizers of these summits is you get to like invite your friends and have them talk about their work, especially the longevity of the commitment to a lot of this work. So I've known Amelia for quite a while. Um, I really appreciated her during the uh, Governor Strickland's administration um, because she was the director for many of us serving on a, a statewide Ohio uh, food policy council as well. We don't have the state um, imprimatur, I guess, at the moment, but we still have a very active Ohio Food Policy Network uh, as well. But Emily comes to us today as, I don't know, really know what your title is. I always think of you as the policy director of the Ohio Ecological Food and uh, Farm Association, or just simply OFA, as many of us uh, know OFA through the years as a member and actually former board member as well. Um, we just, again, really appreciate uh, your leadership in this policy space. And if you could introduce yourself as I start to uh, share your slides, um, that would be great. Well, um, Leslie, that was such a nice introduction. And I'm, you know, just so it makes me feel so good to be able to work with you. And not only is Ohio, but the whole region really benefits from your decades of expertise. And so you are a treasure to us throughout <laughs> the whole Midwest. And we're really glad you're here. So um, yeah, I just have a few slides just to talk about some of the things we can do to build a better food system because we've got a lot of opportunity right now. Um, and I'll just have you move to the next one. But you know, I for us, I, I've really come to realize how important it is that with all the work we do, we're really grounded and like the core values, you know, what's important to us. And, and we at OFA, you know, went through a process last year with about 40 of our members and a consultant just thinking about like, you know, what we really believe. And I just wanted to share a few of them because I think it just helps set the stage for the work we do. And it really makes me feel empowered every day to kind of read these core beliefs that we have. You know, all things have intrinsic value. Um, we are a part of an ecosystem and we exist in community. We're connected with and dependent upon land, water, air, animals, and other people, all of which require our care and gratitude. They are not commodities to exploit. Um, soil, nature, and people are diverse. And that diversity brings strength and resilience. Uh, we believe in being good neighbors. We cultivate a culture of care and we look out for each other and for the earth. And farming really needs to prioritize the well being of air, water, land, people, animals, and community. Um, we are stewards for future generations. And there's a lot more, but the last one I'll share uh, relates to our conversation this afternoon. And that's that democracy belongs to all of us. And it's up to us to ensure that it meets the needs of the whole community. Government and public institutions have a responsibility to protect our health and well being and support healthy ecosystems. So those are just a few of like our core beliefs that guide the work that we do each day. And with the next slide, just, you know, setting the stage with the farm bill, um, you know, I, this picture is kind of a fun one because we were just in Washington, D.C. a couple few weeks ago um, for the Rally for Resilience, which was organized by a whole bunch of national partners. I know we had some folks from Rural Action down there with us, and it was a great opportunity to really um, advocate for a farm bill that's really reflective of diversity, that's reflective of uh, farmer-based solutions to the climate change, and also a focus on communities, not corporations. So that was a wonderful event. But the farm bill, you probably, everyone on this 
this uh, this meeting probably knows the farm bill is you know set up every five years and it really serves as the foundation for what we eat, what we grow, how we grow it, where we grow it. And in the 2018 farm bill, we really saw some good things, some good changes. Um, you know, one of the things that is easy to forget is that, you know, you can get a good program passed in the farm bill, but a lot of the programs that are passed require on yearly authorizations of funding which means every year you have to kind of beg, borrow, or steal to get the money that you want that's been authorized. But if you get mandatory money, that pretty much assures that sure. you're going to have the funding for the programs that you care about going into the future. And whether it was local and regional food systems, beginning or BIPOC farmers, uh, or a number of other issues, we got that mandatory funding for some of these key issues um, for for what was the, the past five years. And we know we've got an opportunity to do a lot more. So if you could go to the next slide, Leslie, it just, um, again, you probably know a lot of this, but this is, it's always good to ground yourself in looking at where that farm bill spending goes. You know, um, it's actually close to 80% of the farm bill funding that goes to the nutrition title. Some of the things that the folks at Community Farm Alliance were just talking about, those critical programs uh, like SNAP, like Seniors Farmer, Senior Farmer uh, Market Nutrition Program and others. While, you know, 20 to 23 percent goes to all of the other kind of agriculture and rural development programming. So, you know, I don't know if you've been following the news, but um, you know, it seems almost every farm bill we get into, there are folks that want to cut the nutrition title, try to put the funding somewhere else. And the Republicans in the House have instituted a policy called cut go with this farm bill, which means that for every dollar you want to add to farm bill spending, it means you have to cut somewhere else in order to pay for that. So they don't want to increase farm bill spending. But that doesn't mean that's how it has to be. So <laughs> um, I, if you want to move on to the next slide, just to really summarize that what we did with our, I'm going to talk about our Farm Bill platform very briefly in a minute, but, you know, we're really grounding our work in the voices of our members, you know, and the majority of our members are farmers. The majority of those farmers are organic farmers, but not all. And we've got people who, you know, who are researchers, who are educators, who care about healthy food access in their communities. And so we conducted listening sessions across the state of Ohio um, last year. We also did some virtual listening sessions and did a survey so that we were sure that the work we were doing is based on the needs, the goals, and the visions that our members had. So the next slide just really summarizes what are five very high level planks of our OFA Farm Bill platform. With the first one being to promote soil health and climate resilience through conservation policy. Um, the second is to increase investments in local and regional food systems, address consolidation, and a lot of people maybe don't focus on the consolidation piece, but we think it's really critical if we continue to uh, allow a lot of the consolidation and concentration that exists, it'll make it even more challenging for local and regional food systems development. So we want to invest, continue investing in organic and sustainable research to give farmers the tools they need to farm the way they want to farm and to provide more support to beginning and BIPOC farmers. Um, one of the things that we also are doing, and I just want to send out an invitation to anybody on this call, because it's certainly not limited to people from Ohio. We've already got some folks from Illinois, Michigan, and maybe actually Pennsylvania as well involved in some of our working groups. We currently have six, seven active working groups 
one for each one of those five farm bill planks that I just talked about. We also have one focused specifically on organic agriculture and one focused on uh, crop insurance reform. So there's probably 60 to 80 members that are meeting maybe every other month to talk about you know, what's important and what they want to see. And Leslie is one of those experts that's been on our local <laughs> and regional food systems working group, giving us really good guidance on things that you know, we can build on from the last farm bill and make better in the next farm bill. So, you know, we're view, you know, getting up to speed on what's out there. Um, looking at other farm bill platforms from other organizations, and then thinking about um, legislation that comes down the road. And I'm going to share a few pieces of federal legislation in just a minute that are what are known as marker bills for the farm bill. So as these legislators are putting out their ideas, here's what we think should be included in the farm bill, we can look at those ideas and say, okay, this is good, but you know what, you're not doing enough of this and, and share those messages with, with our members of Congress so that the, they make it into the final farm bill. And then, so, and then we're developing those recommendations and advocating for the changes that we wanna see, supporting the things that are good, fighting against the things that are bad and, and doing the little tweaks that we can here and there. So I wanted to share just a few of these are those marker bills that you might be interested that have already been introduced. They, they put these bills out there largely to see how many sponsors and co-sponsors can they get? Does the community support these ideas? And then that gives them a good idea if this is something that might make it into the final farm bill. Um, the first one is called the Opportunities for Fairness in Farming Act or the OFF Act. And that deals with providing greater transparency and oversight of checkoff programs. Um, there's been a lot of criticism about abuses and checkoff programs over the years. And the goal of this bill is to reform some of those some of those uh, problems. The Farm System Reform Act is something that deals with the uh, consolidation and concentration I mentioned previously. Um, Cory Booker from New Jersey introduced a number of these bills. He's a really uh, a strong supporter of sustainable agriculture and reform in the Farm Bill. And this Reform Act would take a more critical look when there are mergers. Um, I know most of you are probably aware that we have, you know, just a handful of meat processing companies that dominate uh, the meat market. Um, there's a lot of negative repercussions for that, whether it's for the people who work in those factories, the animals that are raised and sold into those facilities, um, or the people who are trying to, you know, raise healthy, sustainable meat and get it processed in their own communities. They have a hard time doing that. So um, that would look at those mergers and meat processing in other areas and try to have a more critical eye and actually limit any mergers and have, uh, have a report done to look at the state of the industry. Um, the American Beef Labeling Act is really just to correct some of what happened with country of origin labeling in the past where there was a little bit of an exemption for meat and meat processors currently can uh, bring in meat from a number of different countries. As long as it's processed in the United States, they can slap a product of the USA label on it, which we don't think is quite accurate. Um, and then a few others, Justice for Black Farmers Act to try and provide some, um, some support for people who've been shut out of resources through USDA over the years. A new one uh, addressing food deserts and the Healthy Food Financing Initiative Reauthorization Act for that source of money to provide resources to communities looking to improve access to healthy foods on the local and regional level. So that's an important one. And Senator Sherrod Brown is one of the co-sponsors of the Strengthening Local Meat Processing Act. Again, to get at some of those issues where we might see more 
um, niche and uh, regional meat processing options in states across the country. There's a couple that are coming really soon that I want to be sure you're aware of um, because these are really big bills. Um, the Agriculture Resilience Act uh, is has been led by um, Representative Shelley Pingree from Maine. She's one of the very few organic farmers in Congress. She might be the only one on the House side. I think we've got John Tester from Montana on the Senate side. But um, the Ag Resilience Act is really a comprehensive bill looking at how we can have both the local food systems, the food waste and reduction, uh, food waste uh, reduction, the composting, the conservation. I hope I'm not uh, repeating myself here, but just a number of different ways that agriculture can be part of the solution when it comes to climate change, incentivizing and supporting farmers who want to improve their soil health and do managed rotational grazing and things like that. So if you're at all interested in that bill, look up the Agricultural Resilience Act. It's a really important one. I think it's going to be released in the next week or two. And I can tell you for sure that the local and regional food systems bill from Sherrod Brown is gonna be introduced next week. It's called the Local Farms and Food Act. Yeah, we're excited about that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that probably contains things Leslie's been working on for a very long time. Um, you know, it, it kind of refines some of the local food programs that have been part of farm bills in the past, reduces some of the match requirements, which is really positive, trying to make some of the grants with a uh, local food promotion or farmer's market promotion program a little bit more turnkey so that they're less burdensome providing more support to farmers uh, market managers, um, looking at ways to improve the GUSNIP program and, and, and other aspects as well. So, you know, it's really important that, you know, if these are issues you care about, you know, let the people in your community know in the next couple few weeks that these are bills that you support. Um, sometimes I think it's hard because we can spend so much time fighting against the bad. We don't always like celebrate the good. So it's a good opportunity to celebrate some of these good things that are gonna be advanced. And then for state policy, there's a couple of things I'll just share in Ohio. Um, we had a kind of a nice win last year. It's great to hear about the bill that you're working on in Kentucky to try and get some more matching funds for uh, for healthy food. Um, we, we worked actually for three or four years on this bill we called the Family Farm Regeneration Act or Ohio House Bill 95. Um, this bill was signed into law by Governor DeWine last year and it's being administered by the Ohio Department of Agriculture. Um, and it establishes a tax credit for people who own agricultural assets. You know, we think of it primarily as a land access bill, but it could also be, you know, equipment and machinery. So if you're an established farmer and you want to, you know, either liquidate some of your equipment, if you are getting out of farming and you want to, you know, sell or even lease land to a beginning farmer, you can get a tax credit to do it. If you do that transfer with someone who's farmed for 10 years or less. Um, you know, access to land is the biggest challenge that beginning farmers are facing. This is no silver bullet. We don't have any illusions that it is, but it's at least one step, one more tool in the toolbox to try and make, um, you know, land a little bit more accessible to beginning farmers. The tax credit is very modest. It's less than 4%. We wanted it to be higher than that, but we had to take what we got. And when it comes time to reauthorize this bill, we're going to try and get that tax credit increased. And we're also going to try and get more higher levels of tax benefit when land is transferred to um, uh, Black, Indigenous, or people of color farmers. So, um, 
And then the, finally, the, thing, the new thing we're working on, we have a group of people we've brought together for the past three or four years called the Ohio Soil Health Initiative. And it's a bunch of organizations, soil and water conservation districts, um, and farmers and other soil scientists uh, who care about soil health and know the critical role that soil health plays in nutrition, in water quality, in climate, and in a number of areas. So um, we had, through this really good partnership that we uh, brought together, you know, they developed a three-tiered strategy of how to do this work. The first was to, to provide some tangible tools and resources for farmers right now. Sometimes like it's so hard when you're working on policy. It was mentioned earlier how long it takes <laughs> sometimes to get these things moving forward. We started um, a soil health ambassador program. So we've got farmers in different regions of the state who have different kinds of production systems and who are really passionate about soil health and they're willing to mentor other farmers. And it's been really great. I mean, it's not a huge program, but those farmers um, really appreciate learning from each other, hearing about things that have been tried, what doesn't work and simple things like what's the best way to start a really good pasture, for example. So um, that was our first step. We're in our second stage right now. Um, we're spending a lot of time at the Ohio State House. We're trying to get some funding in the state's biennium budget that they're debating right now um, to create a soil health pilot program. Um, this would fund just innovative projects anywhere in the state of Ohio um, with any groups of farmers or organizations that might want to try something so that we can just seed innovation, we can test ideas, and we can promote farmer to farmer learning networks across the state and share what they're learning with other folks. You know, the needs in Southeast Ohio are a lot different than the needs in Northwest Ohio. And there's been a lot of attention and focus on Northwest Ohio because of the phosphorus loading into Western Lake Erie watershed basin, but there are needs all over the state. So we're hoping we can get some, some resources to fund that innovation. And we have a long-term goal of getting some legislation passed and having this work institutionalized a little bit more. So that was just a really quick blitz about some of the things that we're doing at the state and federal level, lots of opportunities. Happy to answer any questions you all might have. This was great, thanks so much. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. Um, so I know we've come to the end of a long day and six long summits. <laughs> But I'm wondering if there's any questions people might have for Emily, Kimmy, Martin. I know we've we've lost a few people. This the summit has been a little disappointed in our attendance this time. Um, but I think uh, this has been a long haul, and we'll definitely urge everyone to uh, share the the incredible amount of archived materials that we've amassed through this journey um, with other folks that they work with. So any questions, comments on regional and state policy? You must have a last word, Martin. No, I hope it's not the last word. I don't <laughs> want to be known for that. Um, but Amali, is it, am I pronounce that right, Molly? <laughs> um, she just re she reminded me that um, in Kentucky we also have the Kentucky Food Action Network, so it's kind of a state um, state policy council sort. Um, and you know, we we today we just talked about one particular bill, but that that network is. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, Kimmy, but it's about 50 people or 80 people from maybe 50 different stakeholders. Um, and in that network has a far more robust um, policy agenda. There are definitely folks in that network who are 
specifically focused on SNAP eligibility, um, things like that. Um, and it's exciting where that network is going. Um, and we, uh, we do a lot of work through that network. And Kimmy is one of four organizational staff folks that uh, facilitate that network. Did I get that right, Kimmy? Is there something you add about KFAN? Yeah, I wanted to say that um, we have Kentucky Food Action Network. Um, it is a policy network that we focus on farming issues as well as feeding and hunger issues. So uh, we have two different working groups. Um, one focused on food and ag systems, uh, ag and food systems, and then one focused on child and adult feeding. Um, we also have uh, a network priorities, and those are food as medicine, farm bill, uh, as well as administrative advocacy. So we also have groups uh, and campaign groups uh, dedicated for those uh, policy priorities. Um, and yeah, we're we have about a hundred. We have about a hundred members who um, who participate every now and then, but we have like about sixty that are very, very um, engaged. So um, yeah, and we are actually going to D.C. on Monday to um, advocate for our policy priorities on the farm bill. Great, oh, that's a great heads up. Yeah, I was just going to say, I heard about that network when I was in D.C. a couple of weeks ago, I think, with Brooke with the Organic Association of Kentucky. It sounds like just an incredible network you all have. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, so that is our website in there, but we also have um, another website as well, uh, KY Food Action Network. Dot. Org, I believe um, that is our new website. It's still in the works. It's getting fixed um, and things. So um, yeah, it's still in the works, but uh, it's still up and you can sign up to be a member and we'll contact you. Um, but yeah, we have a uh, really engaged, uh, uh, we have a steering committee that is very engaged and really steers the network and we're very fortunate for that. So if anybody's interested in joining that network, we would love, love to have you. Um, and we do have some people from the greater Cincinnati area who are, you know, so if you're surrounding us or involved in Kentucky work in any way, um, or just want to know about our farm bill priorities, feel free to reach out. Well, this has been great. I'm going to quickly wrap us up. Um, thanks to all our many presenters today. Uh, we're recording, as I said at the beginning, all these sessions, so they will be archived. Uh, we're working with our new marketing uh, consulting team at the Central Appalachian Network to also identify how we can create even smaller segments of some of the uh, presentations to be able to post and share and hopefully people will repost on their social media. Um, all the folks who have been registered for all six summits will be getting follow-up information. Uh, we'll probably take a little break here, um, but I would say probably coming in April you might see some additional messages uh, in your inbox uh, for all the information that has been created um, throughout the since last July through these six summits. And then I just want to do a huge shout out uh, to Megan and Kayla, who have supported us as the communications team. We've also had a lot of co-organizers uh, putting uh, these summit uh, presentations together. So again, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Patty Miller. Thank you, Alex Cordova from uh, USDA, although Alex has sort of moved on. And then a big shout out also to Maika Sanderson, who had been sort of the Ag Portfolio Manager at the Appalachian uh, Regional uh, Commission. I think at some point we'll do maybe a little follow-up uh, webinar on some of the ARC investments uh, as well. So I'm hoping I haven't forgotten anyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Stay tuned. 
if you are interested in becoming a stronger participant in the Central Appalachian Network, uh, the last infomercial I'll provide is, you know, we have three great food and ag system working groups, healthy food access, that up to this point, Martin and I have been the, the co-chairs. Uh, we have a beginning farmers and entrepreneurs training working group, which Molly Sowash has taken the lead on from Rural Action. And then if you're really interested in the infrastructure piece, we also have a working group around processing, production, aggregation, and distribution uh, that Kathleen Terry Baker uh, from ASD and Adam Hudson from Coalfield have been co-chairs. So there's a lot of ways to connect with us and stay tuned. Thank you all. Hey, Leslie. <laughs> Leslie, I, I want to give a kudos to you who have kept us moving forward through thick and thin over, you know, almost this last year, right? And, um, you know, Alex isn't part of this, but, you know, he's he he was the kind of prodder with a <laughs> with a cattle prod to get this whole thing launched, um, and it turned into a series as opposed to one thing. Um, but again, I I applaud you and thank you for for keeping us going through through the highs and lows and everything else. Thank you for your leadership, Leslie. Well, thanks a bunch. And Kayla, I think maybe I interrupted you a minute ago. That's okay. I was just going to answer a question that was put in the st in the chat um, before we hopped off. Uh, Lisa Arvin asked how to how do we make sure to get further info for future webinars? And I posted the link to the CAN Network um, uh, website. There's a form at the bottom of that page where you can sign up for the newsletter. Um, and I think that they'll be using that probably more in the future as the marketing folks uh, continue their work. So thank that's you all very much. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, well, we are at our final end. Thanks to everyone. See you soon. Thanks, you guys.